yes, yes. Tani tanu tamoru, yes, yes, yes. Ni ire shoku, la la la. Ire to get into a start that. 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 Jason. Comment of the morning already. D. Marisa Nicholas says, I am one proud tomorrow. I love my island. I love, love, love my island. You better love your island. If you don't love this island, don't listen to this show. <laughs> it's going to be a long four hours if right. you haven't got Guam fried. Uh, at 619, the link Wednesday, August 18th. Good morning, guys. Good morning. From Guam, Wisconsin and beyond. Good morning. Morning, 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 Link Familia. There's Good a morning. lot of Guamanians out in Wisconsin. There's Yeah, there's quite a few. Yeah, a, very, many go to Marquette. It's a burgeoning uh, community out yeah. there. Go, but Pat, go. It's 620. Uh, Congratulations to the Bucks. Joe, sir, on the ones and twos here. Good morning, Joe. Morning, boss. Uh, it's Whoa, 620. he speaks. Yes, he does. Uh, let's head out real quick because um, there's actually something. There's an accident going on uh, around the corner where Sabrina Sosmantanani is uh, standing by. We're going to go to her in just a moment. The show is brought to you by Pacific Points. Cabo Enterprises, IT&E, and Jack in the Box. Good morning, Steve Claros in the comments. Good morning. Steve-o! Uh, F. Glenn Lujan, good morning. Good Steve, morning. Steve, a long, 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 Steve and I, you know, Steve and I started at KUN back in 2000 on the same week. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, and then, then he, relo- he relocated to Las Vegas, Vegas in 2019 and everything Correct. like that. So yeah. he, he's he's about as OG as you're going to get from uh, Mary Mae. Where's the beer? Mary, yeah, the beer. The beer. <laughs> uh, Mary Mae Macias, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hey, good morning to all of our GDOE uh, teachers and staff uh, going out there on the front lines. Yeah. It's kind of turning into the front line. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, uh, but you know, but, shout out to you guys and everything. Yeah, like good that. morning and good luck and God bless yeah. you. And to the students and to the parents, good morning. Good morning, morning, morning. At 621, standing by uh, just down the street in Harmon, Sabrina Salas Mantanani of the KUAM uh, news team. Uh, well, did we just lose it? Uh, Bree, good morning. All today, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm here in Dededo along Route 16, where, as you can see behind me, the Guam Police Department uh, is responding to what we heard is a serious uh, crash, an auto pedestrian incident. A woman, as far as we know, was on the road. Uh, she was struck by a vehicle. I'm not sure if that is the vehicle, this black truck. Uh, the uh, victim is not here, so we can only uh, assume that the medics have already uh, transported her. Again, this is Route 16 near the Seven Day Supermarket. The GPD is on the scene responding to a report of an auto pedestrian incident. Let me go ahead and turn around uh, my camera so that you guys can get a better view of uh, the scene here. Uh, Bree, does Again, it... this is Route 16, the report of an auto pedestrian incident. We understand that the uh, victim is a female. Uh, it appears that she may have already been transported by uh, Guam Fire Department medics. Uh, Guam Highway Patrol, uh, they're not here. Uh, typically, when there is a serious uh, crash, they respond. Uh, I did put a call out to GPD spokesperson Paul Tapal, as well as Guam Fire Department spokesperson Cherica Chargala. We're just waiting for uh, more information from them. But uh, again, there is a report of an auto pedestrian incident. I did speak with one of the officers on the scene. Again, they aren't able to provide uh, information because you have to go through the uh, PIO but they did confirm that there was uh, an auto pedestrian incident here this morning. 
Um, Bree, uh, are you able to uh, tell us if it's a fatality or not? Uh, I, I can't tell you that right now okay. until I hear from uh, GPD and GFD. And what are you, I know you just got on the scene, but uh, this is a, a very busy thoroughfare for yeah. the morning commute. Are you anticipating right. that the, they might shut down some lanes to conduct any type of investigation? Yeah, right now it's uh, one lane is uh, is shut down. You can see it right now. Let me turn it around, sorry. Yeah, I was going to say that, that, you know, that that street, I and mean, this, obviously, as, as you head up towards, you know, like Jollibee in the mall, you could go left towards JFK with school back in. You could go right towards Ukudu. Going in the other direction, you could go up towards, you know, Airport Road, towards Revantax and everything. So that part of the island gets really busy really fast. So if you're right. in that area, and, you and, might want to go through Harmon Loop Road. Right. And if you are heading eastbound, say, for example, if you have children that you're dropping off to school at St. Paul's yeah. and you're heading up towards the uh, under the overpass, then you will more than likely run into traffic especially if highway patrol gets here and they start really blocking off uh, right. the roads right now it's not so bad it's just when you get to the point of where the scene is that's when the traffic slows but you can see the line it's not the line is not that long right now yeah okay okay Marie, were there any witnesses on the scene uh they might be across the street uh there's nobody over here at seven day supermarket so i can Actually, there's a guy standing here, but when I pulled up, there was nobody here. Everybody was uh, across the street. You can see residents of, uh, I think it's the Titano Apartments. Right. Okay, so the, that's obviously going to affect uh, traffic uh, headed. Um, what direction is that? I believe it's eastbound, heading towards the uh, the overpass. Okay. And so heading towards Harmon Loop Road, but I'm right here at Seven Day Supermarket. That's right. where uh, the auto pedestrian incident occurred and again it is a female a female uh victim okay uh thank you for that report uh sabrina salas mantani of course uh, out on the street uh right in front of seven day supermarket here in Harmon. uh traffic going to be affected headed eastbound i know we don't do east west on guam so that is heading <laughs> towards the underpass <laughs> in Harmon. <laughs> yeah so, so again I mean, for those of you who, who are you know savvy for you know this part of the island up in um up in Harmon, you could take a alternate route. You could go through Harmon Loop Road if you're like where we are. Give us a honk. Let us know you're listening on, on the link. Or if you want to go through Carlos Heights, you know, you're right over there and you come out um, in Upper Tumon. So if you're heading that way, one way or the other and everything like that, you know, those are some alternate routes. There you go. There's ways around it. Uh, Bri, are you, um, go ahead. Are you going to come I back? I do or? have. No, I have. A, I can do the news from here. Oh, there you go. Well, we, guess what? Okay. We have the technology to do the news from there. On the link. Okay. Let's go. It's 626 yeah. uh, with the very latest. Our first look at news this morning is brought to you by Pacific Points. Good morning to our Facebook Live audience and, of course, to everybody listening here on The Breeze. My name is Chris Barnett with the very latest from the KUAM News team. Brought to you by Pacific Points. Again, Sabrina Salas Matsunani. Good morning, Sabrina. Off it, everybody, the island recorded its 144th COVID-19 related fatality. According to the Joint Information Center, a 65-year-old man with underlying health conditions was pronounced dead on arrival at Naval Hospital in Agania Heights on Monday night. The man did not have any verifiable record of being vaccinated. He had tested positive for COVID-19 on August 9th. The JIC also reports 63 new cases of COVID. The positive results were from 1,080 tests performed on Monday. 11 cases were identified through contact tracing. 390 cases are active. 14 people are hospitalized with two people receiving ICU level of care. There have been 8,547 recoveries. Guam's current COVID case count is now 9,081 people who have been diagnosed with COVID-19 since March of last year. The CAR score, it is now 9.5. The Guam Department of Education also confirms three students tested positive for COVID. And one employee. Now here's the breakdown. One student from Augusta Johnston Middle School, one student from F.B. Leon Middle School, one student from Teedson High School, 
One employee assigned to Estumbo Elementary. GDOE has identified and notified teachers as well as parents of students who may have been in contact with the positive cases to schedule testing. Cleaning and disinfecting of areas of the campuses are taking place to ensure schools are ready for regular hours of operation today. Additionally, the Archdiocese of Virginia announced that it is working with public health to conduct contact tracing following four students that tested positive for COVID-19. Here is the breakdown. It's one student from Notre Dame High School, one student from Academy of Our Lady, and two students from FD. The Joint Information Center also reports that the Vaccine and Antiviral Prioritization Policy Committee, or VAPPC, held a virtual meeting yesterday to develop a policy for COVID-19 vaccines for moderately to severely immunocompromised individuals. The meeting follows a recent recommendation from the CDC that people whose immune systems are compromised moderately to severely receive an additional dose of either the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine at least 28 days after completion of the primary series. The White House, in the meantime, is expected to announce this week that anyone who got the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine should get a booster shot eight months after their second dose. Here's more from Michael George. Americans who received the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine could start getting a booster shot as early as mid-September if the FDA approves the plan. We're likely to do this down the road in phases. The older persons first, health care workers after that. Dr. William Schaffner is an infectious disease expert at Vanderbilt. As with most vaccines, after a time, protection wanes. And so we have to give our immune system a reminder. And that's what a booster would do. The third shot would likely be the same brand as the first two and would come eight months after the second dose. Officials are still waiting on more data before giving guidance on the one shot Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Johnson & Johnson is working on their data and we anticipate information from that quarter will be coming along a little bit later. People with compromised immune systems, like Roy Johnson of Iowa, are already allowed to get a booster shot. Well, I have an autoimmune condition, so when it was made available, I thought, well, may as well uh, go ahead and get the third shot. The push to vaccinate comes as the Delta variant continues to overwhelm hospitals across the nation. In Austin, Texas, ambulances are waiting up to an hour for open beds. Our medics are being overworked like crazy. And starting today in New York City, people patronizing indoor gyms, restaurants, and museums will have to show proof of vaccination. Michael George, CBS News, New York. Michael George, CBS News, New York. COVID drive through testing continues today at the old carnival grounds in Teton. From 8 a.m. to 12 noon, only 400 tests are being offered. They are PCR. It's on a first-come, first-served basis. You are advised to bring a photo ID. And the testing there in Vergata is only offered through Saturday. As for vaccination clinics, there will be one today at Public Health Southern Region Community Health Center in Iran. That is from 9 a.m. to 12 noon, as well as today at the Micronesia Mall from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. With more news, here is Isaiah again. This news update is brought to you by Pacific Points. Do more, get more. Hafede, good morning everyone. Guahu si Isaiah again with your headlines here on The Link. The Army Corps of Engineers is ready to guide the construction of a much-needed new hospital complex from start to finish. The head of the Honolulu District, which oversees Guam, made that known during a stakeholder and press briefing Tuesday, sponsored by Congressman Michael Sinicholas. KUAM's Nessa Lakanto reports. The first step, says Army Corps Lieutenant Colonel Eric Marshall, is to establish a charrette. That's a planning group which brings together the key stakeholders to come up with a long-term scope for the facility. The Corps of Engineers, one thing that we do really well, I'd even say that the Corps is best in show at is planning. Um, because that is that's something we are we are an, um, a uh, unbiased arbiter. Um, we we tend to have that kind of credibility that we're not going to come in with an agenda and that we can bring multiple stakeholders together to try to find what is the optimum solution given the constraints at hand. 
Congressman Sinicola says he is working to secure some $450,000 from the Interior Department, which is needed to be able to engage the Corps. Chief of the Civil and Public Works Branch, Rhiannon Kucharski, says it's a key process that can take up to two years. You want to come out of that phase with a conceptual design, conceptual costs and benefits, and a plan that allows you to move ahead into pre-construction, engineering, and design. The governor has publicly stated a preference for a medical campus that incorporates a new hospital, public health, behavioral health, and a veterans facility. Program manager Don Slack says the charrette will explore all the options. We're going to be looking at, uh, you know, what is it that that our our goal is, and and we'll be providing di different options on how to get there. And those are explored and discussed, and and you end up with, by consensus. Um, this is the preferred option. And that, that option could be a, a campus, or it could be that really what we want to do is bring everything under one roof. Colonel Marshall pitched that the Corps could also manage construction of the project and see that the plans are followed all the way to completion. The Corps, because, because we are moving and we own the process, and we, we tend to, you know, kind of want to move the project forward. We're very, very much focused on turning dirt and cutting that ribbon at the end. Um, we, we, we tend to be a bit of a stabilizing spine. A 2019 core assessment found rebuilding GMH at the current site would cost more than $750 million, but a new facility at a new site would be cheaper. For Guam's News Network, I'm Nestor Lacanto. The Guam Contractors License Board is scheduled to meet today, according to COB Executive Director Buddy Orsini. The controversy surrounding the solar farm project in Manila will be discussed. COB investigators conducted an inspection of the project and the environmental damage in the surrounding area following a notice of a violation that was issued by the Guam Environmental Protection Agency last month. Orsini says they have completed their investigation and have received documents they were requesting from the solar farm's contractor, Samsung. The executive director adds that the board will discuss potential fines and penalties that could be issued to the company. As we reported, Guam EPA cited Samsung last month for failing to implement its approved sediment and erosion control plan. The enforcement agency had issued proposed penalties totaling over $80 million, but Guam law caps, that the, caps the amount it can assess to $125,000. Additionally, the attorney general's office has filed a lawsuit against the contractors. Local SNAP recipients are set to receive the biggest boost in benefits since the program's inception in 1975. The U.S. Department of Agriculture announced President Biden's approval of the historic rise today. Starting in October, the average monthly increase will be $36 per person. The USDA released a re-evaluation of the thrifty food plan used to calculate SNAP benefits. In Guam's case, the total annual allocation will go from $103 million to $130 million, beginning in the new fiscal year, October 1st. In a statement, Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack said, Ensuring low-income families have access to a healthy diet helps prevent disease, supports children in the classroom, and reduces health care costs. He says the additional money spent on groceries will also help grow the food economy, creating thousands of new jobs. USDA says this will be the first time the purchasing power of the plan has changed since it was first introduced in 1975, reflecting notable shifts in the food marketplace and consumer circumstances over the past 45 years. A USDA study published earlier this summer found that nearly 9 in 10 SNAP participants reported facing barriers to achieving a healthy diet, the most common being the cost of healthy foods. The reevaluation concluded that the average expense for a nutritious, practical diet is 21% higher than what the current food plan allocates. For Guam's News Network, I'm Nestor Lacanto. Scheduled for trial to get underway in district court Tuesday morning. Instead, Ricky Santos pleaded guilty to drug charges. His case involves over 3,000 grams of meth. Santos was busted last year in Jigo after federal law enforcement conducted a controlled delivery of a package to his home in Jigo. In addition to the package, officers also discovered more than 1,191 grams of meth hidden in a bag of dog food. Postal inspectors also seized another package d days after he was busted. It contained two vacuum-sealed bags with more than 2,200 grams of sus a suspected meth inside. After entering his plea, his plea agreement was sealed. Federal drug defendant Andrew Manabusin will 
make his initial appearance in the district court today. He was finally extradited from California where he allegedly mailed a package that contained more than 3,600 gross grams of meta Guam. Court documents state that former police officer and former Department of Corrections officer Jose Ananich received the package and drove it to his home in Jigal. Manabusin faces conspiracy to distribute 50 or more grams of methamphetamine. He is scheduled to be arraigned at 10.15 this morning. That's it for now. We'll see you tonight for KUAM News Primetime. This news update is brought to you by Pacific Points. Do more, get more. And again, if you're just joining us, I'm here um, with a breaking story. Uh, there is a auto pedestrian incident that occurred here along Route 16 by the Seven Day Supermarket. Uh, GPD, I just noticed there are some Highway Patrol officers here. If you are planning uh, to travel through this area, you are advised by the Guam Police Department to take an alternate route. They are beginning to block off traffic because they've got to start their investigation. Uh, Actually, they have started their investigation. Again, a woman, from what we understand, uh, was hit by a vehicle. It, it appears that it might be this black uh, pickup truck. I'm not sure where the driver is. He might be being questioned uh, by GPD. Again, if you are traveling uh, towards this area, Route 16, heading towards uh, the overpass, uh, underpass, towards St. Paul's, you are going to run into uh, traffic. It's already starting to pile up as you can see uh in the video again gpd highway patrol i see some officers here they're beginning their investigation uh, after a report of an auto pedestrian incident the victim a woman uh, gfd confirms that she was transported to the guam regional medical city in other news the taliban has taken full control of afghanistan's capital city of kabul with armed checkpoints in the streets Yet thousands of American citizens and Afghan allies remain in the country. Natalie Brand has the latest. The U.S. military has sent more troops to the airport in Kabul to ensure the safety of Americans trying to flee Afghanistan. Throughout the night, nine C-17s arrived, delivering equipment and approximately 1,000 troops. Additionally, seven C-17s departed. These flights lifted approximately 700 to 800 passengers. In a statement, a Taliban spokesperson claims foreign citizens in Kabul are not in danger. When it comes to the Taliban, uh, we are going to look for their actions uh, rather than listen to their words. President Biden forcefully defended his decision to withdraw from Afghanistan and says the U.S. military will remain just long enough to get Americans and our allies out of the country. Time is of the essence, and uh, we all we all share a, a sense of urgency here. But right now, the mission runs to 31st of August, and I won't begin to speculate what, what happens after that. Former National Security Advisor to President Trump, H.R. McMaster, argues some American forces should have stayed to support Afghan allies. They looked over their shoulders and said, who's got our back? And we said, not us. We're leaving. The concern now is for future threats and the safety of the American homeland. Most of Afghanistan is ungoverned space. Hmm. That type of terrain is, is a potential haven for terrorist organizations, Al-Qaeda and, and other groups. Lawmakers, including Democratic Senate Intelligence Committee Chairman Mark Warner, say they have questions for the administration about why the U.S. wasn't better prepared for a worst-case scenario. Natalie Brent, CBS News, The White House. And again, I'm here uh, live on the scene of an auto pedestrian incident that occurred uh, this morning along Route 16. GPD's Highway Patrol is conducting uh, an investigation. They are on scene. We're told that it was a female victim. She has since been transported to the Guam Regional Medical City. We do not know her condition at this point. However, we should tell you that if you are planning on traveling down Route 16, if you're heading southbound, they are closing off uh, the roadways. Uh, traffic is beginning to uh, pile up here. You need to find an alternate route uh, this morning. Uh, once we get more information, we will, of course, pass it along. With your news in tomorrow, here's Ken Conception. When it's an update to get some to be finished tomorrow, give me KUAM News. When it's sent to your family and me to give first a wine bank. Kurantay dos mizon pesos ang diferensya. E may stima ng ofisina ni gobyerno sa nilay slatura ni mananang ganas lapi business privilege tax. 
Azo mas makikerek lai gi egna gementu ni budget pra fisiko no saka in 2022 gi inigap. The administration has estimated that the slapping of the profile has been a business privilege tax of 260 million pesos, while the Office of Finance and Budget of the legislature has estimated 238 million pesos. The argument is that the money is for the adoption of the budget is not the same as the budget. All of this is the category of the estimated slapping of the money is not the same as the budget. Nós estamos se andando mais em busca de uma saque de inferioridade para que não tenhamos um veneno para o ano que o Distrito Court of Guam pagou na dia. Mas este vai ganhar em Califórnia se mais em busca. A nossa resta por um ano há no paquete entre e-mail. Nós estamos ganhando de três mil seiscentos gramas de meth mais em Guam. Gi dokumento ni korti anung nai rumis ibi paketi guini jatuli para gumat niang gi zatigu sa si use anenech nugi ni ofisial polisi asa ni Department of Corrections. Afafana si manibusan ni na talking conspiracy para u distributing kwenta grama pat mas na meth para ma arrange paguna ogan. Otro suntu man ma respond di GPD gi ma report na guai eskolanti gi John F Kennedy na eskola asusteta ni zana susukan un lulok na pipe. Sa podesti na sinesedi man lockdown ni eskwela, gi kasi las desi media gi egan, si gon si Michelle Francois, e public information officer para e departamento ni edukasyon. Makone estudanti ni polisia, za masota gi dispues gati gi manay nanya. Mana manyo e lockdown gi kasi las onsi, gi egan gi dispues. Yutu muna suntu gi finut sa moro gin ni KUM News para pago na Medquilis, mas kezi i Guam Contractors Licensing Board para fanali i pago na dia. I director da zuna ehensya si Buddy Orsini asangan na para madiskuti a zi project ki Solar Farm gi sa Mangilaw. Ma investiga ni ito to i CLB i zinilang zani dinirogan a zuna lugad dispes i notice of violation in na ni Guam Environmental Protection Agency gi mapas na mes. I linga si Orsini na manafunazan esta investigasyon niya sa maresibilo ki dokumento siya ni marikwesta gi ni Samsung i kontratista para a zuna project Solar Farm. Asangan ma si Orsini para madiskuti lo ki kwanto i minita apropio no siya manay a zuna kompanya. Nuri ni por KOAM i Guam EPA sa matsayid i Samsung gi mapos na mes sa puti ma-implementa e zi ma-preba na planon minanehan milak dyan ni Nirogan Oda gwi hinalugad. Ma-isyo ni Guam EPA i ma-propropuso na minita ni mas ki 18 milyon pesos do ay laigun ni gizagmahan sa tiya sedi mas ki 125 mil pesos na minita. Yan ni Rada Bagadong Guan sa susulok ki ikantatista. Para Guam News Network, Guam Sikin Conception. Ya suatu yang penuh temuru sa perniagaan tak zani nak fakta ni family yang mizu gi First Hawaiian Bank. Say hello to the First Hawaiian Bank mobile app. Want a better look at your spending? With Money Map, you can automatically create budgets and manage where your money is going. Know when you have a green light, or when it's time to slow down. Maybe cook more meals at home this week. Set your goals. Track your progress and find your way to exactly where you want to be with Money Map from the First Hawaiian Bank mobile app. It all starts with yes. On August 28th, join us as we illuminate hope at the American Cancer Society Relay for Life Luminaria exhibit at the FDMS Phoenix Center. From 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., witness the illuminous display of lights, a representation of our love and respect for those who have battled cancer. We will remember those who have lost to cancer, honor those who have beaten this enemy, and support those who are currently enduring the treatments for cancer. The KUAM Podcast Network is back and on demand, featuring a great variety of podcasts from our island and region, including culture, lifestyle, awareness, crime, politics, commentary, comedy, and entertainment. Available on most streaming platforms. The KUAM Podcast Network. Subscribe and listen now. KUAM TV has been on the air for 65 years. 65 years of growing, changing, and adapting to the needs of our local community. 65 years of making you smile, laugh, and cheer, and being there for you in times of tears and heartbreak and learning to heal together. We've kept you on the edge of your seats, been a trusted source for you to turn to, weathered many storms together, and celebrated life's big moments. And now at 65, we celebrate all the firsts we brought you over the years and all the firsts that lie ahead as our world changes. KUAM TV, celebrating 65 years of firsts on Guam. 
She had her whole life ahead of her. She was beautiful, humble, smart, but more than 30 years ago. She was brutally raped and uh, stabbed multiple times inside the bedroom. As far as the struggle, she was bound and gagged, so she couldn't put up much of a resistance. Jennifer Mesa was only 16 years old. Were there ever any arrests that were made in connection to her death? No, till this date, none. Coming up on episode two of Crimes Without Conviction, Beauty and the Beast. These are killers that walk among us. And if we don't ever put them away because of what they did before, they still walk among us. It's episode two of Crimes Without Conviction on the KUAM Podcast Network, available on demand now on most streaming platforms. See what's on TV tonight with schedules, network news and notes, local promotions and giveaways on KYM Communications social media pages. Like and follow us on Facebook or Instagram now for all the latest and never miss out. Guam was once home to over 12 native species of forest birds, each with their own unique sound color, and role to play in our ecosystem. However, the arrival of the brown tree snake has threatened their existence. Today, only three of these species still exist in the wild. But what was once lost can be restored. Join the Department of Agriculture's efforts to restore our ecosystem. It is only through partnerships with various organizations and the community that we can give our native birds a future. Support snake suppression. Get the job done the right way by getting the right stuff at East West Rental Center. With years of experience helping builders, we definitely got what you need. Call 646-1463 or visit us in Upper Tumon. Open Monday to Saturday from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. and on Sundays from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. The relationship between Guam and Manila, Philippines is undeniable as we share similar cultural traditions, history, and heritage with generations of Filipinos calling Guam home. KUAM presents a monthly look at the capital city featuring in-depth and engaging interviews on everything from medical tourism to new business and government leaders. Veteran newscaster Nestor Licanto delivers Beyond Our Borders. This special program is brought to you by KFC and the Medical City, where patients are partners. GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's, offers fully covered loading and unloading area with individual pin-coated gate and door access. Call us today at 648-7867 for more information. Do you feel like you're missing out on something? Make life more rewarding with Pacific Points. Earn and redeem points for bill rebates and free load at IT&E, discounts on fuel at Shell, vouchers at Foodies, and United Mileage Plus Miles. You can even pay with Pacific Points at IT&E, Shell, and Foodies. Pacific Points. Do more, get more. KUAM's multi-platform morning show, The Link, just got a little more delicious with Feed Me Fridays. Chris, Sabrina, Jason, and the rest of the morning crew will take some time off each Friday to talk, taste, and tempt you with all the latest and greatest food and drinks on Guam. Old faves, new hits, and everything else we can put in our bellies. It's Feed Me Fridays on The Link, brought to you by King's Restaurants, Ruby Tuesday Guam, and Devondale. The Culture Club returns to KOM Digital and KOM News Weekend Edition, highlighting Guam's young artists, activists, and crafters as they work to protect, preserve, and promote our Chamorro culture. Watch this weekly feature on the digital platforms of KOM News Weekend Edition, brought to you by Hanum. Uno Mixed. We're mixing it up on the last Thursday of every month with a look at lifestyle, entertainment, food, and so much more on the stations, networks, and digital platforms of KUAM Communications. Uno Mixed is presented to you by Docomo Pacific, Better Together, and Pepsi. Coming on the dance, you win nice of the place. Coming on the dance, you have your feel it in space. Drum on the bass, I go move your waist. Drum on the bass, I go move your waist. Uno, feel this your rhythm, feel this.
Like a play on words because I think they're a four piece band, like there's four pieces of instruments that they play, but then their name is four piece, like they're four piece, yeah, which is good. Who's not four piece? It's really the safe thing. That's 655 Wednesday, August 18, 2021. Good morning. <laughs> Let's head into the KUA News Zoom Room where Dave Della Sola, Mr. Pula himself, joins us as the um, pandemic unemployment assistance winding down. When's it end again? Uh, September 4th is the last eligible month, but uh, it will continue. Uh, October 4th will be the last date to file a new claim. And we're looking at sometime in November if it gets approved to shut the system down as far as online. So uh, I look forward in a couple months to be known as David, formerly known as Mr. Pua. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dave, I know that you guys had put a batch out and we've seen, because we get you on a lot, that the number of uh, payouts has been decreasing over the last uh, several weeks down to, I mean, it's still a lot. 10 million is still huge, but um, this is down from, uh, I want to say like 17 million or so. Uh, the last batch was a uh, $5 million more, which was 15.7 million. And um, it was not unexpected. Uh, we did have last uh, batch uh, and we still continue to see a lot of people coming in to fix their claims who haven't filed, who have been putting it off because they see that uh, the, pool, the pool is ending soon. So they've been coming in, fixing them. But uh, the biggest uh, reduction is the work search that uh, the last two weeks of, or the first two weeks of work search was covered in this batch. So you're seeing a lot of people um, either, uh, you know, having a hard time entering the work search or deciding that, you know, it's not worth it or, or they're just, um, you know, trying to still figure it out. There's the t tutorials on how to do it mm. uh, at our website, step-by-step, step, even, uh, even a video. Um, 
and uh, you just answer the questions that are needed. And if there is a question there that you're not sure of, like uh, an address or the person's name, then you just put in there that you do not know it. And, uh, and you know, and continue on, um, don't leave it blank. And you only need to fill out the ones that are asterisk in red. The rest are optional. So uh, there's a uh, log sheet on our website that you're supposed to keep a daily log of all the searches week to week. There's only a couple of weeks left. And uh, you use that to uh, fill, you know, if you get uh, the information on that log sheet, then you'll be covered as far as what's needed in the work search. Dave, so when you said that the uh, payout numbers went down because of the job search requirement, are you saying that people are finding jobs or they're just um, getting off the PUA because they don't want to go look for jobs? How, how, what's the correlation? I, I think you have a, a, a little bit of both. You do have people that are getting work, but um, I'm still hearing from a lot of uh, the employers that are out there that there's still the hesitancy to, to really do the work or to, to get work. Um, I think a majority of the reduction are, are just people still, this is a brand new procedure and like anything, you know, not never having a UI program on Guam, there's gonna be a learning curve. So I see there's gonna be, um, you know, a mass line of people coming down asking for help or, or uh, corrections as they, uh, you know, as the program starts to, to end and as they try to figure out how it's, how to do it. So, um, you know, I'm still think that uh, a lot of these people are going to circle around and uh, eventually get them, uh, get themselves, uh, you know, straightened out. What about a uh, fraud, Dave? I know that early on uh, the first few months of this program, we'd have you on, we'd ask about fraud and there were, you know, quite a few cases. We've seen a couple trials, um, resulting from uh, people trying to fraudulently game the PUA system. Do you still get those uh, fraud cases that you forward? You know, we still get fraud cases and it, it, it's kind of changed. Um, you know, at the beginning of the height of the fraud, uh, we were getting a lot of tax from off island. And uh, we, 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 we've um, uh, quantified it to about 65,000 hits off island of claimants from doing all kinds of various uh, uh, ways of trying to get into our system and hitting it. And now, uh, and we have a lot of these fraud measures in place that uh, it took uh, probably three, four months to customize them to Guam and to figure out uh, what was the best approach to, to thwart the, the attacks. But uh, I think we got a pretty good handle and uh, you know, almost weekly, the Office of Inspector General uh, sends us a uh, you know an email that says, "Here's a list of people we like for you to to let us know uh, you know if they try to file on your you know in your system and how much do they get and all this stuff." So far, we're batting a hundred. Um, none of them. They all went into the system. They all tried to apply, but we DQ them, disqualify them before they can get paid. So that was, uh, you know, that's something that I'm very proud of so far that we uh, were able to catch, you know, all the identified off island pretty well. Uh, I'm not gonna say we caught everything, but uh, I haven't seen anything that's gone through. So most of the fraud that we're dealing with are are just local people, you know, minor stuff that, that are, you know, that might've gotten fired from their job and they continue to file for PUA because they, they think that they're in need or, you know, I, I understand that, that, you know, you still have to put food on the table. You still have to do the, you know, provide for the kids. And those are the things that break my heart, but you know, it's not a qualifying reason. And you see that. And then, you know, then they collect the money and then we, then we find out that, you know, Hey, uh, you fired or you got quit, you quit your work and quitting work is not a COVID reason. Therefore you got to pay it back. And that's when they start hitting the newspapers. They start hitting the, you know, uh, the calling the senators up and saying that, you know, Department of Labor is, is ignoring us. They're not doing our job. You know, we're being cruel. I got kids to feed. I got this, I got that. And, you know, farther from the 
truth. It's just that, you know, you have qualified reasons to give these federal funds out and I have to follow it or else, you know, I'd get in trouble and then remove the program. And unfortunately, when people have to pay money back, it's easier to make us look like the bad guys and um, then to say that, okay, yes, you're right. I did take the money and I, it wasn't a correct eligible way, but I needed the money. You know, I need to feed the kids. And, you know, I understand about these things. And, uh, you know, the best thing we can do is to tell them to file an appeal and ask for a waiver. And if they, if, if the conditions are right for a waiver, then I can waive it. But it has to be, there still has to be a criteria and I have to follow it because, you know, it's not Dave Bellasola money or Department of Labor money or Guam's money. It's, you know, the federal money and it's there for COVID related unemployment. So that's, that's a tough part because, um, you know, people, when they have to owe money or when they get their hands caught in a cookie jar, they get angry, they get mean, they get, they think that if they bully us or they go to the newspapers and they tell one side of the story that we're going to uh, say, oh, never mind, we'll forgive everything. I still have to run a clean program. I still have to follow the rules. And uh, you know me, Chris. If there's any way that I can help or wave or, you know, our people, I, I will always take care of our people first, but I can't jeopardize the, the needs the of the federal name, for the needs. Right. It's the federal. Uh, Dave, what about, uh, so going back to the beginning of the conversation, you had uh, talked about the mm -hmm. UI uh, program. Now, it's been a year of this uh, PUA. Are you disappointed, concerned, or just what are your thoughts on uh I don't know. I feel like did we miss an opportunity to stand up a UI program uh, during the time this pool was running? No, uh, the stand up a UI program isn't a program that you just turn on like pool. It takes years. It takes planning. It takes laws to be passed. And then you have to remember it's an employee. I'm not sorry, an employer finance uh, system. So you have to get the buy in of the of the uh, of of the you know the industry and like anything you you don't typically start an insurance program in the middle of a pandemic you don't want to offer health insurance when everybody's sick on the island you want to offer it when everybody's healthy and the same thing with ui you don't start up a ui program when everybody is you know unemployment is double digits and employers are trying to um you know, get open and survive and get through this. You want to do it during uh, when there's a, a normal, a normalcy and unemployment as well, business as well, and then they can afford to pay into it. So uh, we are uh, uh, looking into it. I, I'm putting out feelers. I'll be asking for some grants. It, it's just, uh, we need to try to get through this program first and get this out of the way and, you know, start recovering. And then we'll start uh, looking at possibly um, looking at a uh, the approach that I, I, I'm going to recommend to the governor would be to try to uh, get USDOL to recommend or to help finance a study to look at our workforce, the size of it, and uh, the cost of putting together a uh, unemployment program, what makes sense, what are the pros and cons, and then, you know, can we customize it to um, to fit the size of our island and make it affordable. These are all questions that need to be done by uh, professionals. And there's, you know, with the, there's nobody here on Guam that knows anything about UI. So, you know, the only thing we know about is the poor. Mm. So that's something that, um, you know, we're looking at. And, and, and as a contingency plan, I'm also looking at this, uh, this same vendor um, if we can put together a disaster unemployment program, because that's when we really need uh, uh, to have an unemployment is typically when we have a typhoon or an earthquake or any kind of major disaster and a lot of the workforce is uh, out of work because the island was, you know, 
uh, you know, when he got hit by a typhoon and is shut down and is rebuilding. Um, we could certainly have a program like that turned on. I mean, you know, put together and switched off and standing in the, you know, on, on the sidelines. And as soon as there's a disaster, all we have to do is flip the switch, you know, put the parameters in, put in the money, and we can disperse those monies very, very quickly. And that would cover a majority of it. So I'm trying to do some options here. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just, um, you know, who has really taken up so much of my time that I've uh, started to just put out the feelers, requests for, uh, uh, you know, uh, companies that can do such a study. And uh, we're also going to get aggressive and see if there's a funding out there that can actually pay for the study. We had a comment yeah. here. Um from Adam, where are people finding jobs at? Is our tourism industry back? Well, you know, I'm sure you've seen everywhere, uh, you know, there's a lot of job fairs going on. There are hotels hiring. Uh, so, you know, there is a, you know, a level maybe up here is normal, but there's a level from down here to going up here of jobs. And uh, a lot of the employers are telling me that they're just not getting applicants. They're having a hard time following them because there's a lot of people who just want to continue on with the PUA. And then when it runs out, then they're gonna go out and start looking for the work. So uh, if you talk to a lot of the business community, they'll tell you that there are jobs available, not enough jobs for everybody, but there are jobs available that aren't being uh, uh, applied for. And that, but they're, you know, we continue, they continue to do job fairs. We continue to help them. We continue to get it out there. And, you know, they are hiring. They're, you know, the people that know, you know, they're not short sighted are going to go after these jobs and not wait till September when the money runs out. And, you know, then there's a mass amount of people looking for work. Right. Uh, so, you know, there, I know that there wasn't enough jobs for everybody. But the job search is exactly what that is. It's just that you have to do job searches. It doesn't say you have to have a job. Mm. So uh, they need to start preparing for for that, learning how to do it for the inevitable. And uh, you know, I I haven't heard anything about from the feds that they're going to extend the program, and it would have to be nationwide. You know, they don't do things just for Guam. It, you know, on a program like this, I've already asked, I've already extended, you know, and put my feelers out and uh, it takes an act of Congress to extend. It. And, uh, and only when that happens, you know, so uh, I have to assume that th this is the last of the program. And we're going to have to shift towards getting everybody uh, towards work. Right. And hopefully our island slowly starts to open up and and, uh, you know, we recover. Uh, Dave, with the Delta variant running rampant uh, in the States, have you heard anything? I haven't seen anything, but just, uh, and I don't know if you, you would uh, hear anything about any possible extension of PUA or implementation of any kind of new uh, unemployment program? The only noise I've heard and I monitored quite uh, closely is the news media and the reports and them saying, well, maybe we should expand, you know, maybe we should extend it. Maybe we should do this. Maybe we should do that. But uh, looking at all the sources of the, uh, of the news, it's only coming from news sources. I haven't, I haven't seen one congressman. I haven't seen one politician yet uh, say that they're going to take it to the floor or take it for discussions. And that's where it needs to be taken. And, uh, you know, everything is there and they can do it very quickly. Like the last two times, they they extended it right at the expiration of, of the programs. And we actually had a, 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 la a time period where, we, you know, the system was off because they were still waiting for the uh, approvals and the signatures. So it can happen. It, you know, a lot of it has to do with, to be realistic, what's happening in the States. And, uh, and with unemployment and the opening up the states, and if they were having a hard time, then we would ride, be able to ride that wave and, you know, and, you know, get that extension. But if the states are trying to hire and open and, you know, they're ignoring the Delta 
the variant, then it doesn't look good for us to get an extension. But I've already, you know, put in for, you know, requests, you know, to use the additional, the, the, our lapse funds to do this, to do that, to see if there's any kind of uh, uh, a way for us to utilize even a, a reduced uh, PUA system or anything, because, you know, they, you know, I explained that, you know, we're a tourism based uh, industry and that industry is based on what's going on in Asia and that's going to take a while for it to recover. So we're going to be, uh, you know, hurting for uh, longer than what the states are. Hey, Dave. And, uh, you know, they all say it's Congress. It's mm -hmm. all in the hands of Congress. Right. Do you anticipate uh, any issues with the, the PUA ending and the minimum wage increase being implemented kind of around the same time? Um, you know, that was what the legislature uh, passed. That was the law. They extended it from last March to September. Um, and I'm just following the law and making sure that everybody knows what it is. Um, you know, so that's not my, uh, you know, my realm to uh, tell when it comes into place or how it comes. I just enforce what the laws are. Right. Uh, Dave, just last thing on this. Um, I know the governor uh, in speaking before the, it was some economic forum where she kind of trotted you out and talked about this program where uh, DOL is going to be subsidizing the hiring of uh, workers in the private sector. Where, where are we with the implementation of that uh, program? Well, uh, we've been in discussions with the governor, Gita, and uh, we all we each had a program which we were going to roll out together, and they were similar programs. So um, in discussions with the uh, Chamber of Commerce and the various businesses, and money being tight, that uh, we're going to roll out GITA, which is the Small Business Pandemic Assistance uh, Grant. And this is money that, that are going out to the small businesses, and they can use that money for uh, expenses, for hiring, uh, for paying down your previous bills to get open, essentially. So this uh, grant money is, uh, you know, more liberal and what you can do with than what my program was. So, you know, their program was to get the business open, get them uh, up and running. And, you know, you can use it also for employment where mine was mostly just for employment. So uh, it made more sense for Gita to get their funding out first and get that kick started and to push mine down the road a little bit. And we'll decide what how the climate is how the economy is and how the businesses are doing and we'll reevaluate it uh you know a little bit more down the road to see if that program is needed instead of having all these programs you know coming out of the gate so uh i, I think that's a smarter approach my approach and uh, my program is more of a longer uh uh you know six months higher within that month but you have to be operating and open, of course. So uh, we're going to let Gita's funding get out there first. And, uh, you know, we're like I said, we're planning it. We're working it with uh, the chamber and the business community. And they said that they need to get open first before they can start hiring. So we're going to um, basically follow that uh, that guide. And, uh, and the, you know, the governor and I have decided to Yes, that sounds like a more logical approach. Right. Uh, Dave, just uh, real quick, what happens to the balance of the PUA monies if we don't uh, spend it all? That that stays with uh, the feds. Remember, that money, the budget that we got, the one billion sixty-five something was just a allotment. It was. It's not here on Guam. We don't have it. Mm -hmm. Every time we batch, like this 10-point... Uh, seven uh, million dollars. That's why we have to take a few days to make sure that all the numbers are good and correct. We have to break it up into different programs. Then we have to send it to DOL, and then they look at those numbers and then they they send the money. They draw down the money to our banks, and that's when we pay it out. That's why it takes 
a week to two weeks to get the money out because of the process. So we don't have that money and it stays <clears throat> like any state, uh, all the, that, all that money stays with, uh, you know, with the feds. I, you know, I've already asked. Yeah. Anyway, we get <laughs> <with that. laughs> All right, Dave. Uh, you know, just they, to, did, they did the same thing. They just laughed and said, uh, "Good try." I had a, a text here from a small business owner a friend who says, uh, "Please, no extension. Um, the new DOL requirement is killing us. They apply online as required." I had over fifty applicants online, and not one showed up for an interview. We all need employees. Do you hear that a lot? Yeah. Yeah, uh, you got to remember, you know, what you hear a lot is from the uh, pool of claimants that say there's no jobs, there's no jobs, you know, there's not, there's not enough jobs. I know there's not enough jobs, but there are jobs. There are people trying to hire, and even the businessmen, uh, you know, I have to be balanced. I have my ear, and I talk to a lot of businessmen, and they're saying they're just waiting it out waiting for september to come because they know that they're just not getting enough claimants coming in and uh, there's not a lot i can do other than you know implement the job search make it a requirement and you know in two weeks this whole thing becomes moot and that's it so uh people are going to have to look for work and, you know, actually, that's a good time for when businesses are trying to get open and trying to get hired. So, you know, I hear the businesses. I also hear the claimants. And, you know, I have to be balanced. But it's, you know, it's the claimants that make the most noise and get to the reporters and make the most stories. Hmm. And, you know, you know what's going to happen in September. You're going to see stories going on and on about how they're not making ends meet. There's no jobs for them. You know, they you know, pull us out and, uh, you know, I feel bad, but, you know, I keep telling them for months, go out and get these jobs now. There are jobs available. And if you need those jobs, get it out. Get it now. Don't wait for Pua. But, you know, I'm sounding like a broken record. Well, Dave, I think the problem is you're telling people to go get a job that pays way less than the Pua does. I mean, just simple math. Well, you know, the realities are the realities, right. you know. All these things, the pool came in, it helped our island, it helped our economy. Totally. We got 10 million going out into the, you know, in our economy, it's kept us afloat. I mean, $874 million. What a blessing. In the last year and a half. Yeah. That's a lot of money. Yep. All that money went to the people and went into our economy and went into the business. So, um, you know, we can't do this forever. You know, we're going to have to. And it's going to be a rough patch. I know it. And it's going to be tough for me to endure it. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm going to go from the most popular guy to probably not so popular. <laughs> Nobody's going to know you anymore. You're going to have to have mercy on me, okay? Yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Dave. <laughs> thanks for thanks for the chat this morning. I appreciate it, too. All right. Thanks for letting me get the information out. Uh, Dave Della Sola, Department of Labor Director. Yep, in a couple weeks, this will all be moot. But what a blessing, man. What a, I mean, a billion dollars. This really um, helped a lot of people. I don't even want to say stay afloat because the PUA is so much more than uh, what a lot of people were making in the in their, you know, pre-COVID job. Um, and so... It wasn't just keeping them afloat. I mean, honestly, a lot of people were balling out on this PUA. You're not right, sir? I mean, yeah. Uh, so, tough, guys. Got to get out there. Get a job! Nine twenty-five an hour is the minimum wage. Uh, PUA ends September 4th. There it is. 722. Hey, we're going to continue the show next. It's brought to you by Pacific Points Cabo Enterprises. 
it and Jack in the Box miss a link, miss a lot, so don't go anywhere. We're back. Good morning. On August 28th, join us as we illuminate hope at the American Cancer Society Relay for Life Luminaria Exhibit at the FDMS Phoenix Center. From 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., witness the illuminous display of lights, a representation of our love and respect for those who have battled cancer. We will remember those who have lost to cancer, honor those who have beaten this enemy, and support those who are currently enduring the treatments for cancer. The KUAM Podcast Network is back and on demand, featuring a great variety of podcasts from our island and region, including culture, lifestyle, awareness, crime, politics, commentary, comedy, and entertainment. Available on most streaming platforms. The KUAM Podcast Network. Subscribe and listen now. After a year with so many games and events delayed or unplayed, the world is ready for anything and everything in the world of sports. KUAM Communications is ready with more games, more championships, and more specials that are guaranteed to bring out the fan in you. Don't miss a minute of gameplay from NBC on KUAM TV 8 or from CBS on KUAM TV 11. Every month, we'll bring you the action and excitement. Brought to you locally by Michelob Ultra, Superior Light Beer, Marianas Irrigation and Landscape, and Docomo Pacific. Just more more great reasons to tune in and turn on so you'll fall in love with TV again with the best from KUAM Communications. Catch SportsLink on the KUAM News Morning Show, The Link, every Friday to hear about the latest in sports news, game schedules, athlete profiles, and more. SportsLink, brought to you each week by Cure Alkaline Water and Mariana's Irrigation and Landscape, airs every Friday across the multimedia platforms of KUAM. Tune into the broadcast on Breeze 93.9 FM on KUAM TV 11, live streaming through the KUAM News Facebook page, or view highlights on YouTube, KUAM News Facebook, and Instagram. SportsLink is hosted by Dave Delgado through KUAM Sports, and he will make sure that everyone knows what is happening on the fields, in the gyms, and everywhere in between. KUAM Digital presents a series highlighting the wide array of talents on our island. Whether they're a standout gamer, extreme athlete, performer, or have a unique skill to show off, we're showcasing them every month on Wow Factor. Brought to you by Mountain Dew. Do the do. The Culture Club returns to KOM Digital and KOM News Weekend Edition, highlighting Guam's young artists, activists, and crafters as they work to protect, preserve, and promote our Chamorro culture. Watch this weekly feature on the digital platforms of KOM News Weekend Edition, brought to you by Hanum. GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's, offers fully covered loading and unloading area with individual pin-coated gate and door access. Call us today at 648-7867 for more information. Do you feel like you're missing out on something? Make life more rewarding with Pacific Points. Earn and redeem points for bill rebates and free load at IT&E, discounts on fuel at Shell, vouchers at Foodies, and United Mileage Plus Miles. You can even pay with Pacific Points at IT&E, Shell, and Foodies. Pacific Points. Do more, get more. Say hello to the First Hawaiian Bank mobile app. Got a question about your finances? You've come to the right place. Bring all your accounts together, even those that aren't with us, and see the big picture, right down to the smallest detail. Unlock powerful tools like Insights and Money Map that help you save time and take control of your finances. When you connect accounts with the First Hawaiian Bank mobile app, it all starts with yes. Bananas and Zulus, 727. Yeah, big news to start the show. There was a uh, apparent auto pedestrian accident yeah. right around the corner from us here in Harmon. Um, if you're familiar with that area, either when you're coming you know, from the Micronesia Mall, you know, you're on Marine Corps Drive and you turn either right at Wendy's or you turn left after you pass Jollibee and everything like that, right in between Iglesia Ni Cristo Church near it and uh, Seven Day Supermarket. And apparently yeah. a 
a female pedestrian was hit. Uh, Serious injuries. Yeah. It's been transported to the hospital. Uh, that's a high traffic uh, area. There's a lot of pedestrian traffic around there. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, it is a, by definition, you know, a an industrial area. Uh, but also there's a lot of apartment buildings there. There's, you know, um, uh, Hemlani Apartments is, is right in that area. Also, what's interesting is, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a bus stop there. Right. Uh, where kids go to school. There's mm-hmm. also uh, further up the road near, you know, the back entrance of the Micronesia Mall. There's also that uh, bus stop that uh, public transit picks up riders. And so you'll constantly, like, you know, like I take that road like all the time, but you'll frequently see people uh, wait until they feel that the traffic is a little light and or they'll just kind of like hold out their hand yeah, and hopefully, yeah, be, yeah. and you know, they dart across the road yeah, yeah. because, you know, um, and I'm not knocking, you know, like the layout of the road or DPW's engineering and everything, but the only real official crosswalk is if you're all the way up at Jollibee. Um, and the nearest, the second nearest crosswalk is if you're way further down the road, right near in front of Iglesia Ni Cristo. That's at least, yeah, three quarters of a mile. You're right. There's not enough crosswalks. Yeah. So, so it it is it is kind of a hike. Um, but you know, Jay, we have but there's sidewalks. a lot of pedestrians there. Yeah. We have sidewalks in Harmon, so count your blessings, guys. But yeah. just really watch the road. Uh, you know, we live here. You know, there's a lot of traffic in Harmon. We got all these people who uh, go to the intersections and ask for money. Uh, and there's just a ton of them at each intersection, and this is the time where they kind of like make their way around. Uh, mm-hmm. So just you know, be careful. Guys. And also, there's people that they constantly just like you know, d- you know, they'll dash right across the street because yeah. they're trying to get to pay less. You or know, there's people who are there's exercising. There's a bakery there. Well, it's open now. Okay, so Route 16 Army uh, Drive by Fatima Road. Uh, right. We just got the word from. Uh, our police friends that it's open now. All right. And, okay. you know, prayer, prayers up to the uh, to the female who was involved in that and everything. Yes, like that. Hope, she's, hope she's okay. Right on. And good job, Sabrina, to get out there. I mean, th- we got this info right when the show started. Yeah. Uh, she was out there before the police, you know what I mean, uh, reporting on the scene for you guys, the people of Guam, as we know this uh, is very impactful news that's going to affect your morning commute. So good job, Bree. Yeah. She, first, first on the scene. That's how yep. we do things. First and only yeah. on the scene. <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually, you saw like when you know when we we're playing some of the news stories and everything like that, there were some pedestrians who just went out and were concerned, or there were people taking their their normal morning walk either for exercise or because they had to go somewhere, and they were they were like, "Oh, Missa, you know what happened?" And she was kind of apprising them of what happened, and right. and she brought the video to you guys. So good there job. you go. So be safe out there, uh, guys. And good morning. And yeah, the cops were on the scene, of course. That meant the highway uh, patrol to be. Bree just texted me, "Hey, the cops were on the scene." Yes, I know. Okay. <laughs> Uh, it's 7.30. All what? credit where credit is due. Yes. That's, that's brief. <laughs> Wednesday, August uh, 18th. Uh, thank you guys in the comments here. Uh, Adam comments in, is there still aid for those who cannot afford rent or did it end? Um, yes, there is. There's the earn, uh, the emergency rental assistance, the ERA program. We're getting actually getting Bernie uh, Guinness, the deputy of DOA, on tomorrow for an update on that. Remember... Um, with this mortgage aid and the rental assistance aid, the problem they were having, and this is just my take on it, and then I'll tell you what they said officially, was that people were finding a way to pay their rent during the pandemic, even though they were behind. And so now that this assistance came out, a lot of people just don't even qualify for it. And so I think that last time we had her on, I want to say they were trying to like figure out a way to... Um, finagle it i guess so that more people could qualify because it's a huge amount i want to say it's like 20 million or so that they have something like that right and so that was the problem is that they weren't able to give out uh this money because no one is eligible for it same thing with the mortgage assistance so i I remember that we had ray taposny on and they were also trying to figure out how to um get creative if you will with uh, these programs so that, you know, more people can get them because it is, I mean, when you talk about the negative impact, right. um, That people have suffered during, during this pandemic, a lot of people, uh, I mean, God, I don't know anybody who didn't suffer uh, a negative impact, whether it was just, um, you know, having to buy the wipes, having to buy the sanitizers, having to buy the masks, having to stock up on food. Every time there was a lockdown, um, there's just so many expenses that people incurred. So, um, it, but I think what's happening is it's very difficult for them to prove that when they apply for some of these, uh, programs, right? Cause I've heard uh, from different people who've applied for the rental assistance and they just can't get it. And it's because they moved money. A lot of people were just moving money from this account over to here to pay for the rent. And you know, I mean, good luck trying to tell Uncle Sam like, Oh, 
I drained my savings, but the rent got paid because he's just going to be like, oh, well, it got paid. Okay, next. <laughs> uh, 731, we're going to take a really quick break, and we're coming back with the speaker of the Guam Legislature as we are in the midst of the budget discussion at the Guam Legislature. Speaker Therese Terlahi is coming up next. Good morning, Guam. On August 28th, join us as we illuminate hope at the American Cancer Society Relay for Life Luminaria exhibit at the FDMS Phoenix Center. From 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., witness the illuminous display of lights, a representation of our love and respect for those who have battled cancer. We will remember those who have lost to cancer, honor those who have beaten this enemy, and support those who are currently in during the treatments for cancer. Say hello to the First Hawaiian Bank mobile app, where you get smart insights into your finances so you can make smart decisions with your money. With a daily personalized feed, you can compare your monthly income to spending. That's better. Discover where your money is actually going. You might be surprised. See what's essential and what isn't. The more you use the app, the smarter it gets. With insights from the First Hawaiian Bank mobile app, it all starts with yes. Looking for TV schedules, upcoming sports, or special presentations, or what you may have missed over the busy week you had? Well, look no further than KOM Digital Digest. This weekly email newsletter puts all kinds of information in the hands of subscribers each and every week. Just subscribe, and we will make sure you keep up with your favorites and stay informed and entertained throughout it all. Go to KOM.com, click on the newsletter tab, give us your email address, and you are all set. Brought to you in digital partnership with King's Restaurant and Ruby Tuesday Guam. It's the KOM Digital Digest, your weekly guide to the latest information and best entertainment on the stations and platforms of KUAM. A new musical competition series from NBC focusing on original music is in the works, and they're looking for contestants. American Song Contest is modeled after the hit European phenomenon Eurovision, which has produced some of the most talented performers the world has ever known. The show's looking for individuals and bands from all types of music to find and act in every state and territory, including representatives from Guam and the CNMI. Go online to americansongsubmissions.com to enter and submit your original song submissions now. Must be 16 years or older and groups cannot exceed six people. Additional conditions apply. So apply today and get ready to rep our island on the national stage. American Song Contest debuts next spring on NBC. Good morning. Guam, Wisconsin, and beyond. This is the link. Hello, 737 off a day. It's Wednesday. 63 new COVID-19 positive cases, including our 144 death reported yesterday. 
Uh, currently 14 hospitalizations. Two in ICU. Right. Um, as we have had the Physicians Advisory Group uh, Chair, Dr. Ho Wen, on Friday, we're spiraling out of control. The governor needs to implement some sort of restrictions immediately, was the word that he said. Uh, he came on Monday, and the gist of his talk on Monday was, I don't know why they didn't follow my advice. And it wasn't necessarily just his advice. Yeah, it was it's the physician her group. Physicians Advisory Group, her state surgeon cell yeah um mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah so we haven't heard anything and that's kind of that's the thing i guess when you know people are let me just give it to you real guys people are freaking the hell out right now with these school positives with the surge we're going on week three this is week three of double digit cases and we're not talking like 10 cases we're talking like 20 30 60 100 and to me we had the mayor umatic on yesterday brie and there's no restrictions in place right now and he was he's already self-restricting he said hey they're gonna have a party down here in my village you're only getting 25 seating for 25 that's it and i'm seeing that across the board in different areas where people are just kind of like hey whoa let's just dial it back here and that, I mean, we got each other through this pandemic, and if that's what we got to do to just survive out here, then let's do it. You know, it's um, it's just unfortunate that we're not seeing the same level of concern that the community has reflected in um, the leadership. Uh, that being said, let's go ahead and go to the KUA News Zoom Room, Speaker Therese Terlahi. And I guess we'll kind of just start there, Speaker, because there's a bunch of stuff, uh, the budget and all that. Uh, but what do you make of this going on week three of this, uh, what Dr. Ho Wen calls a Delta surge? Well, um, watching the numbers last night with my family regarding the schools, I I agree with you that it's uh, very scary for families who have uh, children in school, especially if teachers. I have a lot of teachers in my family, and they really, um, I think, uh, have not heard much reassurance as to you know how they're going to get through this without further surges. So. You know, but I, I'm hoping, of course, we're hoping that uh, when DOE agreed to open, that they made contingency plans and that they very much planned for this occurrence and that how they, what they were going to do in response. So, um, you know, we're looking to see their responses as swiftly as possible. I, I, I've seen that they've switched some classes to online, those that have to be in isolation, but you know, they might they might have to consider a lot more of their mitigation strategies to go full out. Yeah, and I mean, there's like hundreds. We had John on yesterday, and there's like hundreds of kids who are currently uh, in right. quarantine or isolation because they came into uh, close contact. So, right. I mean, I, yes. Yeah. No, I was going to say, and, you know, we've seen the videos of the you know the different places in the schools and the buses where where the close contacts could be happening and. And I know that the teachers are working hard. It's like all hands on deck, according to them, uh, during breaks and things that uh, they everybody's trying to do their part to keep these schools safe. The teachers and the, the faculty, the aides, um, cafeteria people, everybody has to help in that. And uh, so it's a big burden that we're p- placing on them. And so, yeah, we just got to keep giving them whatever support they need. Yeah. But uh, I just hope that their plans are are you know based on the science of well this. these are the plans they have and that's what uh superintendent fernandez says that this is the science that those uh, the vaccine is what's different uh when you look at today versus a year ago when i mean if we had these same numbers a year ago speaker everything would just be shut down you know what i mean right yeah. Yeah. well what's concerning is that we're, we're having these um you know if we're getting kids with positive yes. you, we know they're probably not vaccinated at all yeah right, and yeah. so I am concerned about that. Mm-hmm. Totally, and so are just a, a, a ton of the uh, parents. Uh, let's go ahead and switch gears now to the budget. Yeah, we're in budget deliberations now, and uh, we've been uh, at it for the last week and this week, and um, we're still on revenue projections. We kind of have, uh, um, it's been tough. You know, as you know, we've had so much uncertainty in this budget. We've got half of our not half, but we've got a large portion of our budget that is contingent on agencies getting ARP funds, which we can't control and we can't um, determine, you know, if that's really going to happen or not. But that's how they've come in with their requests saying, this is all we need. 
for example, public health, 17 million short, and um, we're hoping for ARP funds. So the budget's uh, a little bit, you know, out of whack that way. It's uh, it doesn't really reflect, I think, the needs of all these agencies. It's going to rely; these agencies are going to rely on ARP funds. That's one kind of uncertainty that we're facing. We're facing uncertainties as to um, revenues. You know, we have. Uh, different um, opinions as to whether we should be optimistic or not in the next fiscal year. And, uh, you know, but uh, we did have our economists come in and say, um, it should get better next year, fiscally, right? That uh, particularly for the government of Guam, and he made it very clear that that might not translate to getting better for individuals or families, but it will get better for the government of Guam. And I thought that was very interesting. But what I want to do with the budget is to make sure that we take advantage of um, some of the the money that we are going to be receiving from the federal government that we have never received before. And this is reimbursements for income tax credit, earned income tax credits, reimbursements, of course, for the child tax credits. And uh, I think we just got some good news this morning that uh, they finally approved our child tax credit plan. And so Daphne should be rolling that out as soon as possible. She she told me it's going to be monthly, regular, regular, it's supposed to be regular monthly payments. So all that child tax reimbursement money that's going into a trust fund, and then uh, you know they're gonna be able to pay that out, which is great, I think, because it's dedicated for the purpose that it was intended for, and it's not going to be used for anything else. I want that to be the treatment for the earned income tax credit uh, reimbursement as well, because, um, this is an opportunity for us on Guam to catch up on tax refunds. You know, we are still behind. There are still processed and waiting $23 million in returns or refunds. And I can't see why, especially right now, especially in the next fiscal year, giving them back their money, their own money in these refunds as fast as possible, hopefully 30 days, you know, longest two months is what I've seen other jurisdictions um, we should do that. We should give them back their money as fast as possible. And we can do that if we have the discipline to set this money aside, the reimbursement, set it aside for the first time ever and, and dedicate it towards um, those refunds so that they can pay what's outstanding and that revenue tax can continue to process the 7,000 that are still outstanding and um, and just continue to to get this money back. I think that would that would go a long way for these families who very much count on their refunds. And uh, with the credits that um, these credits are going to people who are in the most need again, and uh, to encourage them to keep working. So I, I think uh, we should embrace this policy as much as possible and and lock that money away and dedicate it all to refunds and put um, make everybody know that we're putting our cash aside yes and it's cash and we're going to put it aside and we're going to make sure that those refunds get paid and first everything else comes second um well that's part of the budget we've got other things in the budget of course that um uh you know we've just got uh, a lot of um agencies are relying on special funds as well right and so we know that these special fund revenues have not tracked well this year at all They've uh, underperformed, I guess, what you could call it. But uh, for example, customs is the best example. So they're, 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 they don't get the passenger fees, so they're not getting enough uh, revenues to you know, cover all their needs. So uh, we are covering them in this budget through some general funds. And uh, it looks to me like if, if the special funds uh, you know, just don't pull in what we're even predicting now that uh, that's another area where we might need to see transfers or, or ARP funds used. But um, yeah, so there, there are uncertainties, but I think there are also certainties that um, we can be a little bit optimistic about. And that is uh, if we can use this ARP funds as much as possible to give direct aid to families uh, that it's going to be spent, that they can spend and that they can, you know, it will, circulate in the economy that that's going, you know, that's going to help them, of course, and help the government of Guam collect revenues in DPT and other areas. And that, um, and then we will be able to provide those critical services that are funded by the BPT and other taxes. So, so did, uh, is BBMR and DOA and DRT, are they 
uh, cooperating? Are they saying, yeah, we can use the ARP for this, and okay. we plan on using the ARP for that, or anybody ask no. them point blank what's all. the plan? They have a, a hard no on um, releasing any further details on the ARP uh, or even making any kind of commitment that this shortfall will be covered with ARP. They won't say that anymore on the record, and so. But we did hear the governor in the last press conference that she had say straight out that, of course. Uh, if there are critical agency needs that are not that there is a shortfall that that she will cover those. So I am counting on that, and I think that's really the only way we can go when they come in 17 million dollars short for public health, mm -hmm. right? Then, then it's almost a moral obligation that uh, they they need to cover that. <laughs> okay, you mentioned the that's governor uh, during her press conference. Oh, she had some okay. nice words to say about you and. And the legislature, and I think she even uh, crossed uh, her eyes and dotted her T's when she issued that executive order regarding her um, all rise plan. I think we all know now this is her plan, um, without question. But it, in in that executive order, I mean, she kind of she said it's incomprehensible and defies all logic that the Guam legislature would pass such conflicting bills which if signed into law would be impossible to reconcile, operationalize, and implement. The Guam legislature has proven ill-equipped to pass a law that creates and allows the executive branch to implement a program that gives our people direct aid and also complies with federal mandates regarding the use of ARP funds. Yada, yada, yada. Well, so you guys um, ill-equipped? You guys <laughs> inept? You guys, you know, when course, I, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't think you want to hear my real reaction to that, but it's, uh, I don't think that was <laughs> totally do really or necessary. I think it's a big distraction to just uh, talk like this in government, right? We're trying to get the ARP, I mean, we're trying to get the rise payments out. That's what we are trying to do because there's been an unbelievable unnecessary delay in getting these rise payments out to people who need it. That's the bottom line. And if we have to do, you know, pass laws, I mean, even more than one, that's, you know, it, even that, you know, we can debate all day whether that's even necessary or not, but we are trying our best from what powers we have to force this issue. And that's what we're trying to do, yes. And uh, I think it, it highlighted for her that her new All Rise program is really what has created such an um, almost an unimplementable process. So I'm glad that she scrapped it all, started again, and I just hope that they can get it out before September. I think this whole new, you know, again, we're going to wait until September to pass this money out that we've been holding since, May. was it March or, you know, May? Yeah. That, that is just not necessary. And I know that we have competent people in the government that can create this program and get this money out uh, before September. So that's just, that's how I feel today. It's kind of like, um, forget about all of these other semantics and let's just get that money out to the people. That's one thing down that we can, you know, uh, put into their hands. And then let's get on to the next one because we have so much work to do when it comes to getting this money out into the hands of the people that need it. And I think we should do that sooner rather than later. And the sooner, you know, that's why I'm, I'm very adamant about getting refunds out sooner. Mm -hmm. Despite the progress that Revintax has made in processing these things, we're not paying them as fast as they are processing them. When has that ever happened? And so that's what I'm saying. All this cash, um, it needs to go where it's supposed to go. And um, that's, I don't know. That's how I'm. That's how I'm going to continue to operate. I'm going to continue to advocate, yell if I have to, do whatever it takes, you know, to make sure that this this money. And I, it's not a good sign going forward if if we are going to sit on money that we all agree on where it's supposed to go, right? If we had a big dispute as to where that money is supposed to go, that's a whole different story. But we all agreed. That's where this money agreed. We agreed since last year where that money should go. And when we agree, then we should get all our resources together and make that happen. Yeah. And so I'm hoping that we're going to come to an agreement here that uh, we've got earned income tax reimbursements coming in, and that should go out in tax refunds. We've got child tax credits, and we should do everything in our power to make sure revenue and taxation 
that's where they're going to get it out you know as soon as possible these you know that's it's actually one of the number one questions i'm getting right now is uh, from people asking about this child tax yeah um, yeah us too so and I know they need it, you know, and I just think it's really bad timing for us to wait till September. School started in August, you know, it doesn't make any sense to me. And uh, there are a lot of needs in families and now, you know, um, a lot of fear. And here we go again. And I don't, I don't think that's necessary. I yeah. just say, let's, let's make it our policy and let's make it our government's, you know, mission to, um, let's, Try to get an agreement on where the money is going to go, and let's try to get it out as fast as possible. Let's use our brilliance and our resources to do that instead of uh, to, you know, do any other kind of silly things. To get snarky in the executive orders. Uh, <laughs> Madam Speaker, but, you know, I, I see a really disturbing trend here that started with your law where you had, uh, there was a law passed $10 million to Guam Memorial Hospital. Totally, right. they ignored that. GMH never got yes. the $10 million. And now we have this yes. RISE Act, which was vetted by the legislative body. I mean, the Governor Lou served, I think, like two terms as a senator. I don't know if she's like the expert on being a senator. But, I mean, it, it passed muster with the body. They gave it to the AG. The AG had no issues with it. The only right. people that had a problem with it is the administration. And, and I agree, it was this all RISE that totally made this thing unimplementable. And for her to, yes. to, to spend, I mean, a whole page on her executive order just bashing on the senators, it's so unproductive. Yeah. I, don't, I don't see what it accomplishes. Oh, I agree. Unproductive is a good word. Um, but, you know, I agree. we need to focus. We need to focus again. We've got, for example, what you described, the $10 million for the hospital. It never went there. The hospital's claiming now it doesn't need it. And uh, it just, it's not logical to me why we would deny the hospital 10 million when the army corps of engineers comes down and tells us that these repairs need to be made for the safety of the patients all right and uh, so we as the legislature have been very conservative in our budgets for the past few years and we have because of our conservative revenue projections you know we we've said that oh no you know we want to keep it uh, tight we have brought in more revenues than we've predicted and we've allowed these surpluses and these excess revenues to be spent beyond legislative control you know and so they tell us they were spent on deficit uh, we reduced the deficit but when we asked them well exactly what did you pay we can't get a list they won't tell us exactly what they paid and 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 so it's an, another one of those mysteries the big black holes in this government that really those are the most frustrating things for me you know when we're trying to set policy that that you know if we can't get the facts straight from our own government that's why i was frustrated enough to run i mean in the beginning you know and i i i am just um, dismayed that we are still um doing this that information is not flowing freely but anyways we've seen these large surpluses and i i don't want to see that at, uh, this year what i want to see is i want to dedicate any additional income that we might like for example bbmr is predicting that we're going to get 46 million dollars more in bpt than what we have currently predicted in the substitute bill right and so i if that really happens i want to plan for that right now i want to put it in the law i don't want to wait till the end of the year to see whether we have an excess and whether and what they spent it on i want right now to plan that we're going to take all of that excess and we're going to put it towards payment of refunds Again, I just think that should be the priority this year. We need to pay this money out. This money gets directly back into people's hands and it can be spent again and uh, circulate in the economy. And I really think that's how we are going to help people is we're going to make sure that any excess that comes in is not spent on any other whim. It's spent, it's given back to the people whose money it is in the first place. That's my question. All right. Well, well, well that's what you think. Can I can I share some good news? Uh, we, uh, Bill 36 got passed. This is that bill I was talking to you about uh, a couple of weeks ago regarding the submerged cables. So this kind of sets a precedent for the Chamar Land Trust. I'm hoping that they're going to be able to lease submerged lands, that they're going to, you know, be required to follow all environmental laws and permitting and everything like that so that we can protect our reefs and everything uh, that we've got in these submerged lands of course these are coastal areas these are these are the waters right the waterways and uh 
but uh, we've we were able to edit the bill in committee to make sure that uh, we get a significant um, amounts for the Tomorrowland Trust as rent. And we've tried to make it more compatible with what is done globally, you know. So Guam is in the global stage here as a, a, a hub for these, these cables. Uh, they connect, you know, the United States to Asia, to Australia, to, you know, they connect the world. So yeah. we want to be part of that. Uh, we want to continue to encourage this industry. We want to be con and encourage, you know, our own um, uh, use of this type of technology here, but also, you know, as a hub, we want to get what's fair for Guam. We want to ensure that the Tomorrowland Trust is going to meet its mission. And so I'm also on a, a very focused uh, mission here myself, you know, and what I've got remaining in this term is uh, I want to see the Tomorrowland Trust come up with residential properties that people have been waiting for for so long. And this money from these submerged cable leases is going to help them. It's going to allow them to survey and bring in infrastructure to those areas. As you know, we have so many problems with uh, Tomorrowland Trust properties without having water and uh, access. So basic, basic, you yeah. know, we want affordable housing. This is how you do it. You make sure the property gets surveyed and you bring in water, right? And I think we can do this between the submerged cable leases, between the ARP funds, between the infrastructure bill that Congress is currently considering. There is no reason we cannot succeed in this. And we have to, you know, people are running out of time. If we can't bring them out of, bring them to affordable housing, bring generations back to, you know, out of poverty. I just think uh, we are running out of time on that, and that's why I am very focused on this. And I'm very happy that the bill passed. Right. So, I'm well, congrats, uh, Speaker. I wanted Thanks. to kind of uh, bounce off what you were saying um, when you mentioned the uh, Tremor Land Trust because there were some very lofty um, things you guys were trying to do with your American Rescue Plan uh, funding plan that you submitted to the governor. Um, there was money for Tomorrow Land Trust, money for infrastructure, money to stave off potential rate increases. With Guam. It was very ambitious, but there was one thing I wanted to key in on before we let you go, and this was the scholarship for uh, professional yes. and technical students. Um, we know now that, that your spend plan, it's kind of in the cloud, right? Uh, we haven't heard from the governor, but what would you say to those people who, who had a stake in not just that part of you guys' plan, but everything else that you put down on paper? Well, I think they should know that um, I still believe in those goals very much. I think my colleagues do as well. I'm telling you, it's one of the few times we have all agreed and they've agreed on priorities for, you know, this, this money to be spent. And actually, to be honest, I was surprised that we all agreed and, but we did. And so I, I am not going to waste that consensus that was hard earned, you know, and, um, I think well deserved because the plan is to get this money out to folks who need it the most. And like you described, these uh, programs that we want to fund, their needs, their needs for Guam. That if we can take care of bringing in medical professionals, if we can, you know, train our own people to be medical professionals, give them the resources that they need to do this, they will. They will serve Guam, and uh, they will serve for future generations. And that's. That's the best use of this money instead of decades and decades of shortage of nurses, decades and decades of shortage of doctors. I say put all, all the money we can into that. That's why I'm very proud of that plan that we we determined that that is a priority. All these needs areas for Guam that we have not been able to fill teachers for years. We have shortage of teachers that we are going to make it worth their while to do these jobs, first of all, and we're going to make it so that uh, their education expense, which is, you know, uh, enormous, uh, that we're going to ease that burden on them because we realize that that is a commitment, uh, a lifetime commitment in most occasions that they make for the people of Guam out of love. And I say, you know, we give that back to all of them. We give it to our, we give it to our, our kids, our, you know, our, our future generations. We give this to them, that, that opportunity to, you know, we want them to give back to Guam. I say we give them that opportunity and we fund their education needs and we fund those in the areas that we need the most. So I'm very proud of that and I'm, I'm not giving up on that. Uh, we're going to do everything that we can to 
ensure that these ARP funds get spent in a way that it's going to give us the best future, you know. Thank I think you. this is our opportunity. I, I, I'm, I think my colleagues will agree with me 100%, you know, and they've done this. And, you know, we've seen a lot of shifts. For example, uh, in this year's budget, we've seen some shifts for even the Tomorrowland Trust, our, our budget chairs, been able to make sure that uh, they're they're going to get that those vacancies filled finally you know that uh, we're going around in circles there with um, you know just not enough resources not enough manpower to get their their basic needs done and that is get these residential leases out so I am looking and I'm looking at things differently too you know I want I want uh, production lists almost like I want to see how many pieces of land are going to be surveyed, how many residential leases are actually going to go out, and then I'm going to hold them accountable. You know, uh, every time I have contact with them, I pretty much, you know, I'm I'm checking the numbers, and uh, so I think, and I think that's our our. Um, I talked to my colleagues, you know, on the side, and it looks like they're all pretty much dedicated to doing that, especially those with committees right now, that they are going to hold those agencies accountable for every dime of ARP funds that they get and uh, that they are put to these uses that we say are, you know, they're generational. Right. Yeah. They're going to change thank you, Madam Speaker. We got to run. Thank you. Right on. All right. Thank there you so much. You guys take care. Have a great day. All right. Appreciate it. Good luck. Uh, good luck. And <laughs> uh, yeah, very, very uh, inspirational there. Generational changes that could be made with this $600 million. Hey, it's 803. Quick break, and we are coming back on KUAM TV next, right here on the Link. Good morning. We got your six at six a.m. with the Link on Breeze ninety three point nine FM. Bree and I connect you with all the latest news and information you need to know to start your day. Then check back with Guam's news leader at six p.m. for the day's top headlines with KUAM News Prime Time from six a.m. Good morning, KUAM TV. Good morning, Sabrina. Hi. Good morning, Jason Salas. Good morning. Good morning, Joe Sir. What Thank about? you. Right on. Hey, uh, we're did you guys have breakfast this morning? No, we didn't. Did you? You've been with us the morning, so I don't know. Are you getting breakfast? If that sounds good, I'm actually. I'm actually thinking. What, okay, before we get into news and everything, and there's yeah. a lot to cover today. What? What? Do you, if we if we had our Jason is like a pancakes kind of guy. Right. Yeah. If, or if, waffles. If, if budget was not a concern, and we just talked with the speaker, and all, budget is obviously a concern for yeah. them. But but if we had no no such budget concerns, what would you guys like for breakfast this morning? I want a smorgasbord of local favorites, the favorites of the local Shimoro people. Uh, you know, some tamales gisu, some empanada, Ooh. some of those empanaditos, the one with the meat and the, the peas inside, right? You know what I mean? Like a a tasting platter. <laughs> Of pure meat and just a bunch of different little and things, and fried fried stuff and meat. That's not bad. Yeah, it's I would actually like. The morning is the time to eat that stuff. Yeah, I would like a continental breakfast. Honestly, like one you of would. like hotel style. Yeah. yeah. Cantaloupe and some fruit. You know, some pancakes. Some uh, some nice chilled juice. How about you, Bree? She wants to eat the news for breakfast. <laughs> 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 it's eight oh six, guys. <laughs> Uh, here's who's coming up on the show. We're getting Vera Toposnia, uh, the community defense liaison for the office of the governor. Uh, so they were pretty busy with the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, they, the Army Corps, I think, had uh, gone on a field trip to the hospital with the governor. And then they also were um, in a press conference with Congressman Mike San Nicolas. So uh, they were definitely out and about. Uh, we'll find out about that. Uh, also uh, getting the acting administrator. Uh, for the Division of Environmental Health. And she's also the Acting Environmental Health Officer, Leilani Navarro. Now, they did their COVID inspections, their regular inspections, and they're also tasked with enforcing the governor's mask mandate. Okay, so that's coming up. And then we'll uh, catch up with the American Cancer Society as they're doing their luminaria ceremony on the way. All of that on the way here on the link. Miss the link, miss a lot, so don't miss it. 
Let's go to get into the news now, our 8 o'clock newscast, which is brought to you by our friends at Pacific Points here with the very latest from the KUA of News team. Good morning, Sabrina Salas Matanani. Off it, everybody. The Guam Police Department's Highway Patrol Division is investigating an auto pedestrian incident that occurred just before 6 o'clock this morning along Route 16 near the seven day supermarket in Dededo. A woman with serious injuries was transported to the Guam Regional Medical City. There's no word on her condition. The island recorded its 144th COVID 19 related fatality. According to the Joint Information Center, a 65 year old man with underlying health conditions was pronounced dead on arrival at Naval Hospital in Agania Heights Monday night. The man did not have any verifiable record of being vaccinated. He tested positive for COVID on August 9th. The JIC also reports 63 new cases of COVID 19. The positive results were from 1,080 tests performed on Monday. 11 cases were identified through contact tracing. 390 cases are active. 14 people are hospitalized with two people receiving ICU level of care. There have been 8,547 recoveries. Guam's current COVID-19 case count is 9,081 officially reported cases since March of last year. The CAR score is now 9.5. The Guam Department of Education also confirms three students tested positive for COVID and one employee. The breakdown, one student from Agata Johnston Middle School, another from F.B. Leon Guerrero Middle School, and one student from Tietzen High School. Then there's the one employee assigned to Astumbo Elementary. GDOE has identified and notified teachers as well as parents of students who may have been in contact with the positive cases to schedule testing. Additionally, the Archdiocese of Agania announced that it is working with public health to conduct contact tracing following four students that tested positive. Here is that breakdown. One student from Notre Dame High School, another from Academy of Our Lady of Guam, and then two students from Father Duaneus Memorial School. The Joint Information Center also reporting that the Vaccine and Antiviral Prioritization Policy Committee, or VAPPC, held a virtual meeting yesterday to develop a policy for COVID-19 vaccines for moderately to severely immunocompromised individuals. The meeting follows a recent recommendation from the CDC that people whose immune systems are compromised compromised moderately or severely, receive an additional dose of either the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine at least 28 days after completion of the primary vaccine series. The White House, in the meantime, is expected to announce this week that anyone who got the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine should get a booster shot eight months after their second dose. It comes as COVID-19 cases driven by the Delta variant continue to surge around the country. Michael George reports. Americans who received the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine could start getting a booster shot as early as mid-September if the FDA approves the plan. We're likely to do this down the road in phases. The older persons first, healthcare workers after that. Dr. William Schaffner is an infectious disease expert at Vanderbilt. As with most vaccines, after a time, protection wanes. And so we have to give our immune system a reminder. And that's what a booster would do. The third shot would likely be the same brand as the first two and would come eight months after the second dose. Officials are still waiting on more data before giving guidance on the one shot Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Johnson & Johnson is working on their data and we anticipate information from that quarter will be coming along a little bit later. People with compromised immune systems, like Roy Johnson of Iowa, are already allowed to get a booster shot. Well, I have an autoimmune condition, so when it was made available, I thought, well, may as well uh, go ahead and get the third shot. The push to vaccinate comes as the Delta variant continues to overwhelm hospitals across the nation. In Austin, Texas, ambulances are waiting up to an hour for open beds. Our medics are being overworked like crazy. And starting today in New York City, people patronizing indoor gyms, restaurants, and museums will have to show proof of vaccination. Michael George, CBS News, New York. Sorry, just a second. I have to pull up my computer. Caught me off guard there. 
And again, with the news, Sabrina Sauce, Matt Tanani. Well, how about that breakfast? Good COVID, morning. COVID drive through testing continues today at the old Carnival Grounds in Teason from 8 a.m. to 12 noon. Only 400 tests are being offered on a first-come, first-served basis. They are PCR tests. No symptoms are required. Bring a photo ID. The free testing is being offered through Saturday. As for vaccination clinics, there will be one today at Public Health Southern Region Community Health Center in Inarahan from 9 a.m. to 12 noon, as well as as today at the Micronesia Mall at 11 o'clock this morning. And this just in from the governor's office of the Leon Guerrero Tenorio administration announces that the child tax credit plan prepared by the Department of Revenue and Taxation, which includes provisions of the implementation of the advanced child tax credit program for Guam residents, was approved today by the Internal Revenue Service and the U.S. Treasury. Payments of the advanced child tax credit credit and reimbursement to the government of Guam for the child tax credit were authorized by the American Rescue Plan, which was signed into law by the president in March. The IRS and U.S. Treasury approved a total of $93.5 million in initial funding for the advanced CDC. In addition to this, DRT was approved to receive $300,000 to fund administrative expenses for the implementation of the program. The rollout of the advanced child tax credit for Guam requires the credit to be paid in equal monthly installments. Revintax will be working to make the first installment of the advanced CTC as soon as possible. With more news, here's Isaiah Uggen. This news update is brought to you by Pacific Points. Do more, get more. Hafede, good morning everyone. Guahu Si Isaiah Uggen with your headlines here on The Link. The Army Corps of Engineers is ready to guide the construction of a much needed new hospital complex from start to finish. The head of the Honolulu District, which oversees Guam, made that known during a stakeholder and press briefing Tuesday, sponsored by Congressman Michael Sinicolas. KUAM's Nessa Lakanto reports. The first step, says Army Corps Lieutenant Colonel Eric Marshall, is to establish a charrette. That's a planning group which brings together the key stakeholders to come up with a long-term scope for the facility. The Corps of Engineers, one thing that we do really well, I'd even say that the Corps is best in show at is planning. Um, because that is, that's something we are, we are an, um, a uh, unbiased arbiter. Um, we, we tend to have that kind of credibility that we're not going to come in with an agenda and that we can bring multiple stakeholders together to try to find what is the optimum solution given the constraints at hand. Congressman Sinicola says he is working to secure some $450,000 from the Interior Department, which is needed to be able to engage the Corps. Chief of the Civil and Public Works Branch, Rhiannon Kucharski, says it's a key process that can take up to two years. You want to come out of that phase with a conceptual design, conceptual costs and benefits, and a plan that allows you to move ahead into pre-construction, engineering, and design. The governor has publicly stated a preference for a medical campus that incorporates a new hospital, public health, behavioral health, and a veterans facility. Program manager Don Slack says the charrette will explore all the options. We're gonna be looking at uh, you know, what is it that that our, our goal is, and, and we'll be providing di different options on how to get there. And those are explored and discussed, and, and you end up with, by consensus, um, this is the preferred option. And that, that option could be a, a campus, or it could be that really what we want to do is bring everything under one roof. Colonel Marshall pitched that the Corps could also manage construction of the project and see that the plans are followed all the way to completion. The Corps, because, because we aren't moving and we own the process and we, we tend to you know, kind of want to move the project forward, very, very much focused on turning dirt and cutting that ribbon at the end, um, we, we, we tend to be a bit of a stabilizing spine. A 2019 Corps assessment found rebuilding GMH at the current site would cost more than $750 million, but a new facility at a new site would be cheaper. For Guam's News Network, I'm Nestor Lakanto. The Guam Contractors License Board is scheduled to meet today, according to COB Executive Director 
Buddy Orsini, the controversy surrounding the solar farm project in Manila will be discussed. COB investigators conducted an inspection of the project and the environmental damage in the surrounding area following a notice of a violation that was issued by the Guam Environmental Protection Agency last month. Orsini says they have completed their investigation and have received documents they were requesting from the solar farm's contractor, Samsung. The executive director adds that the board will discuss potential fines and penalties that could be issued to the company. As we reported, Guam EPA cited Samsung last month for failing to implement its approved sediment and erosion control plan. The enforcement agency had issued proposed penalties totaling over $80 million, but Guam law caps, that the, caps the amount it can assess to $125,000. Additionally, the attorney general's office has filed a lawsuit against the contractors. Local SNAP recipients are set to receive the biggest boost in benefits since the program's inception in 1975. The U.S. Department of Agriculture announced President Biden's approval of the historic rise today. Starting in October, the average monthly increase will be $36 per person. The USDA released a re-evaluation of the thrifty food plan used to calculate SNAP benefits. In Guam's case, the total annual allocation will go from $103 million to $130 million beginning in the new fiscal year, October 1st. In a statement, Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack said, Ensuring low-income families have access to a healthy diet helps prevent disease, supports children in the classroom, and reduces health care costs. He says the additional money spent on groceries will also help grow the food economy, creating thousands of new jobs. USDA says this will be the first time the purchasing power of the plan has changed since it was first introduced in 1975, reflecting notable shifts in the food marketplace and consumer circumstances over the past 45 years. A USDA study published earlier this summer found that nearly 9 in 10 SNAP participants reported facing barriers to achieving a healthy diet, the most common being the cost of healthy foods. The reevaluation concluded that the average expense for a nutritious, practical diet is 21% higher than what the current food plan allocates. For Guam's News Network, I'm Nestor Lacanto. Scheduled for trial to get underway in district court Tuesday morning. Instead, Ricky Santos pleaded guilty to drug charges. His case involves over 3,000 grams of meth. Santos was busted last year in Jigo after federal law enforcement conducted a controlled delivery of a package to his home in Jigo. In addition to the package, officers also discovered more than 1,191 grams of meth hidden in a bag of dog food. Postal inspectors also seized another package d days after he was busted. It contained two vacuum sealed bags with more than 2,200 grams of sus a suspected meth inside. After entering his plea, his plea agreement was sealed. Federal drug defendant Andrew Manabusin will make his initial appearance in the district court today. He was finally extradited from California where he allegedly mailed a package that contained more than 3,600 gross grams of meth to Guam. Court documents state that former police officer and former Department of Corrections officer Jose Ananich received the package and drove it to his home in Jigal. Manabusin faces conspiracy to distribute 50 or more grams of methamphetamine. He is scheduled to be arraigned at 10.15 this morning. That's it for now. We'll see you tonight for KUAM News Primetime. This news update is brought to you by Pacific Points. Do more, get more. The Taliban has taken full control of Afghanistan's capital city of Kabul with armed checkpoints in the streets, yet thousands of American citizens and Afghan allies remain in the country. Natalie Brand reports. The U.S. military has sent more troops to the airport in Kabul to ensure the safety of Americans trying to flee Afghanistan. Throughout the night, nine C-17s arrived delivering equipment and approximately 1,000 troops. Additionally, seven C-17s departed. These flights lifted approximately 700 to 800 passengers. In a statement, a Taliban spokesperson claims foreign citizens in Kabul are not in danger. When it comes to the Taliban, uh, we are going to look for their actions uh, rather than listen to their words. President Biden forcefully defended his decision to withdraw from Afghanistan and says the U.S. military will remain just long enough to get Americans and our allies out of the country. Time is of the essence, and uh, we, all, we all share a, a sense of urgency here. But right now, 
The mission runs to 31st of August, and I won't begin to speculate what, what happens after that. Former National Security Advisor to President Trump, H.R. McMaster, argues some American forces should have stayed to support Afghan allies. They looked over their shoulders and said, who's got our back? And we said, not us. We're leaving. The concern now is for future threats and the safety of the American homeland. Most of Afghanistan is ungoverned space. That type of terrain is, is a potential haven for terrorist organizations, al-Qaeda and, and other groups. Lawmakers, including Democratic Senate Intelligence Committee Chairman Mark Warner, say they have questions for the administration about why the U.S. wasn't better prepared for a worst-case scenario. Natalie Brent, CBS News, the White House. And we are now going to head in uh, to the Zoom room where we have Vera Taposna. She is the Community Defense Liaison for Governor Lulian Guerrero. Uh, good morning, Vera. Uh, so glad to have you on the show. Um, first, we'll just start with, um, have you heard anything with, with um, the possibility that Afghan refugees or even American citizens may be evacuated from Afghanistan to Guam? No, we have not had any confirmation. We kind of heard there's, you know, there's a lot of uh, scuttlebutt out there, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, but we have not had any confirmation from DOD um, as of this morning, as of early this morning. Okay. Um, we understand that there was a, a meeting at Anderson Air Force Base uh, yesterday. Um, was was Adalupa involved or the gov anyone from the governor's office? Um, uh, part of those discussions? No, oh, okay. no, no, we were not. Mm -hmm. And um, I understand that you were part of uh, the delegation that went with the governor to uh, D.C., right? You, I think you were, you yes. were part of, yes. I don't know, uh, part of the advance team. I'm not sure, uh, but you had left prior to yes. the governor. Well, I had, I, yeah, I had a, I had a conference um, out there, and then the governor came out a, a few days later. So, yeah. It's kind of advanced. Okay, can you tell us about the conference then? Yeah, we had a there's a there's a DOD conference uh, for communities um, that our office is um, uh, that ha has membership in. So uh, they did their first uh, in you know in a uh, face to face meeting um, since COVID. Uh, so so I, you know we we had an opportunity to attend that. Um, you said it was the Department of Defense that hosted the meeting. No, it's a it's it's a nonprofit organization. It's the Association of Defense Communities. Uh, we're members, and uh, they have a, by a, two conferences a year, mm -hmm. um, and they bring out you know DoD officials to talk about uh, community you know policies affecting communities um, and initiatives uh, uh, that communities can um, you know pursue. Uh, whether it's grant related or partnerships uh, so okay so what were some of the takeaways uh, from that conference that you that um, we might be able to implement or use here on Guam um, well you know they, they issued some policy uh, uh, activities that they've they're taking up in the NDAA the, the defense authorization bill um, uh, related to like climate change, which has uh, uh, become a priority uh, initiative for Department of Defense and their installations. Um, and so they rolled out uh, what that policy uh, looks like, uh, what will be happening, um, you know, in the coming months uh, that, it, that communities could be involved in. Um, we also uh, were privy to uh, the Office of Local Defense Community Cooperation that provides grants to communities uh, to address mitigation infrastructure, which is uh, where we usually get most of our money for uh, defense-related impacts and mitigation. Uh, and so they, they're they rolling out their uh, uh, second year of uh, defense, community infrastructure projects and defense manufacturing initiatives. Um, so those were some of the key things, and then um, I'm also it was it's my first year uh, being nominated and accepted uh, in the federal outreach uh, committee of that organization, and so we look at uh, 
you know, policy decisions uh, in Congress uh, that affect communities. And we kind of work together uh, to talk about um, the synergies uh, between our communities um, and going in as, as, a, as a group uh, to address some of these um, concerns that we have. Did you meet with anybody from, I guess, the Department of Defense or the State Department or have any discussions with the possibility of um, Afghan allies being evacuated so, here while in D.C.? Yes. So I think, um, you know, during the governor's press conference uh, about the trip, uh, I was I was uh, in almost um, almost all the meetings um, that uh, she attended. Uh, and uh, we were able to talk about the hospital to pretty much all of the federal agencies uh, that we visited uh, to include Department of Defense. Um, so that was a, a priority for the governor uh, in, in talking to all these federal agencies, you know, among, among other initiatives that she had um, that that are not directly related to Department of Defense. But, but yes, I was in most of those meetings. What about this uh, Army Corps engineers uh, visit, uh, Vera? Um, if you could kind of maybe shed a little insight on uh, what was discussed, because I know that there was a press conference with the congressman that also featured the Army Corps. So what was kind of the difference between um, these two uh, meetings, if you will? Well, um, what I can say is that the, you know, we've had the engagement, or the governor has had the engagement with Army Corps of engineers. Um, since 2019 uh, and that was at the time that she had requested for that study to be conducted on the condition of um, the, the hospital um, and since that time uh, you know the, the the new hospital based on the evaluation the the construction of a new hospital has been a priority for the governor so um, there we've had several meetings uh, in that regard um, with Army Corps um, and I think this, this meeting, uh, in the last couple of days, uh, was really indicative of some of the, you know, activity that the task force, uh, her medical action, um, task force has been working on, um, for several months now in gathering, uh, data, um, to get us to the next stage or to the next level. Uh, and is this, uh, Vera, is this um, relative to, I mean, I know it's the governor's new hospital plan, but is, with this Army Corps thing, is this just uh, one of the avenues that she's kind of uh, exploring to, to bring down the cost of it? Oh, yeah, and, and utilizing, uh, yeah, utilizing their expertise. Uh, obviously, they talked about, you know, planning and, and uh, the charrettes. Uh, that they could uh, support the, you know, the territory uh, in planning for this new hospital and supporting uh, the governor and the team. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's something that we've been discussing with them, um, and they are uh, well, very well um, uh, known as, as they mentioned uh, in planning. Um, so, so that is that is a, a pathway that the governor is seriously considering. All right. Um, so you haven't heard anything about the Afghans, but if you did, you'd let us know. And once the governor lets everybody know, I, I'm, she is, uh, I know that she will be notified by Department of Defense so once an official word comes down or, or the State Department. Right. What are you um, What are you tracking, though? I mean, what? Give it to me in percentages. What are we What are we looking at? No idea at we all. We are not. We are not tracking any number whatsoever. Um, we are not tracking any projected arrival of Afghans to the island. Um, I, I, I probably would defer to, to DOD, uh, who would probably be planning. Um, or required to yeah. plan in the event that there's a that there's a uh, there's a movement of Afghans to yeah, We did so defer to uh, 
We did defer to DOD, but then they deferred to the State Department, so. Yeah, State Department is the lead agency, yes. So we're just going to email yeah. President Biden and get it over with. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Vera, for your time this morning. I know okay. you got to run. Okay. All right. Thanks. That's Thanks, Chris. Yeah, Take you care. Too. Okay. Uh, Vera Taposnia, the Governor's Community Defense uh, Liaison. It's Wednesday, August 18th, right here on the link. Brought to you by our friends at First Hawaiian Bank. Let's go ahead and do Chamorro News with Uncle Ken Conception. Good morning. Buenos dias, tanaw pedes. Tige sun tugi tunut sa morning ni KUAM News. Pernisenta ni familia mito gi First Hawaiian Bank. 42 million pesos ang diferensya in my estima ng oficina ni Gubetno sa ni legislatura ni Manananggan na Salapi gin ni Business Privilege Tax. Azo mas makikirig lang giyag na gumento ni budget para fisiko na saka ng 2022 giinigap. Yan ang administrasyon sa may estima na Salapi ni Parofatu Halum gin ni Business Privilege Tax sa 280 million pesos mientras yung oficina ni Finance and Budget gin legislatura sa may estima 238 million pesos. Managmentu ang mga nagwinigidos para ma-adapta ang titima de CD is nigun mo na i-budget. Todo to siya na kategoryo ni maistima na salapi ni Manananga sa manakonfort ma. Gimas, nasuto mo si Andrew Manibusan ni umatsaki ni Fridrapo kinaranta di sin Beneno para ano ni District Court of Guam pago na dia. May extra right gano'ng California sa Manibusan ang may resta po na humanahan o pakete in si email na sa ganin ni G. Chess Mead sa isentos grama na meth magigwahan. Gi dokumento ni Korti anong na irumisibi paketi gwini za tsuli para gumaniya gi za zigu sa si Jose Hanenich no ginin official policia za ni Department of Corrections. Afafana si Manibusan ni natakin conspiracy para u distribu 50 grama pat mas na meth para o ma-arrain pago na ugaan. Otro asunto, man ma-respondi GPD gi ma-report na gwa eskulanti gi John F. Kennedy na eskwela ha susteta ni za natsutsukan un lulok na pipe. Sa podesti na sinesedi man lockdown ni eskwela, gikasi las desi media gi ekan, sigon si Michelle Franquist, e public information officer para e departamento ni edukasyon. Makone estudanti ni polisia, za masotta gi dispues gati gi manay nanya. Mana manyo e lockdown gikasi las onsi, gi ekan gi dispues. Yutu muna suntu gi finut sa morugin ni KUM News para pago na Medquilis, maskedzi i Guam Contractors Licensing Board para fanali i pago na dia. I director adzo na ehensya si Buddy Orsini asangan na para madiskuti adzi project i Solar Farm giza Mangilaw. Maimbestiga ni itaw to i CLB i zinilang za ni dinirogan adzo na lugad dispes i notice of violation in na in i Guam Environmental Protection Agency gi mapas na mes. Ilinga si Orsini na manafunazan esta investigasyon niya za maresibilo ki dokumento siya ni marikwesta gin ni Samsung i kontratista para adzo na project Solar Farm. Asangan mas si Orsini na para madiskuti lo ki kwanto i minita apropyo no siya manay adzo na kompanya. Nuri ni Port KOAM i Guam EPA sa matsayid i Samsung ng mapas na mes sa puti ma-implementa e di ma-preban na planon minanehan milak dyan ni Nerogan Oda ang guhi na lugar. Ma-isyo ni Guam EPA i ma-propropos na minita ni mas ki 18 milyon pesos do ay laigo ni gizagwahan sa tiyasedi mas ki 125 mil pesos na minita. Yan ni Rada Bagadong Guan sa susulok ko i kontratista. Para Guam News Network, Guam Sikin Conception. Yasuto yung finutamuro sa presenta sa ninafato ni Familia Mito di First Hawaiian Bank. Say hello to the First Hawaiian Bank mobile app. Want a better look at your spending? With Money Map, you can automatically create budgets and manage where your money is going. Know when you have a green light or when it's time to slow down. Maybe cook more meals at home this week. Set your goals. Track your progress and find your way to exactly where you want to be with Money Map from the First Hawaiian Bank mobile app. It all starts with yes. Again. Good morning, 835. That's your morning news brought to you by First Hawaiian Bank. Uh, you know, I just got these uh, a bunch of texts here from Dr. Ho Wen, uh, Physicians Advisory Group uh, Chair. He's coming on tomorrow, uh, but he's still uh, really imploring the governor to implement uh, some type of restrictions. Uh, but he, he messaged me, please remind parents to keep their children home if they are sick or if they have a PCR test that is pending. We all have to do our part to keep our schools safe. Do not send your children to school if he or she has a PCR test that is pending. Can't blame the school if the parents don't cooperate. Schools are safe as long as parents pay attention to these basic common sense courteous guidelines. Again, the PCR test is a 24-hour one, yeah. right? And so mm -hmm. basically, if you send your kid to go get tested, yeah. your child does plan on having them be out the next day from right. school. Right, yeah. And I think the, the uh, real question in this whole argument is, um, 
how do you convince the parents what's an acceptable level of COVID positivity to have, right? I mean, I mean, I know it's so cliche, one case is too many, but we're going to have one case. We're going to have two. Um, but is seven reasonable to you guys with hundreds of students in uh, quarantine and isolation? That's uh, the big job that, I mean, you know, they don't have to quell anybody's concerns or fears or reassure anybody. That's not their job. Their job is to educate your kids, and they feel that they're doing that with these uh, and doing it, you know. That's a, a very, w- that's a very, very good question. I, I yeah. mean, naively, I mean, I'm nobody, right? But I would think oh, it might on, be kid. it might be proportionate to the size of the school, like right. the student body. Yeah. Oh. I mean, because we we had John on yesterday, and I mean, just uh, I think at, at so at the middle school, high school level, you have if a kid is positive, then they go around to different classes, yeah, and they then have to isolate all those kids, and then they all kind of work from home. And so we had thrown out a number yesterday, like, oh, it must be like 200 kids. And he was like, oh, no, it's more than that. Mm -hmm. So um, this is the challenge, I think, is how do we kind of navigate this um, vaccine world um, and accept that we're going to have positive cases? We are. We are going to have positive cases. But I think, you know, we shouldn't be accepting 63 cases, 107 cases, 50 cases, 40 cases a day. Totally not. Uh, I really just would kind of uh, implore Adeloup, along with Dr. Hoa, to come out and at least Masaya say something, because although it's not a GDOE's job to reassure parents or quell their fears or their concerns, it's definitely the job of uh, the governor and lieutenant governor to do. Uh, it's 838. We're going to take a quick break. We're coming back with the Minority Report and Senator Chris Duenius right here on the link. Good morning. Hey, bro. On August 28th, join us as we illuminate hope at the American Cancer Society Relay for Life Luminaria exhibit at the FDMS Phoenix Center. From 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., witness the illuminous display of lights, a representation of our love and respect for those who have battled cancer. We will remember those who have lost to cancer, honor those who have beaten this enemy, and support those who are currently enduring the treatments for cancer. Guam was once home to over 12 native species of forest birds, each with their own unique sound, color, and role to play in our ecosystem. However, the arrival of the brown tree snake has threatened their existence. Today, Only three of these species still exist in the wild. But what was once lost can be restored. Join the Department of Agriculture's efforts to restore our ecosystem. It is only through partnerships with various organizations and the community that we can give our native birds a future. Support snake suppression. The KUAM Podcast Network is back and on demand, featuring a great variety of podcasts from our island and region, including culture, lifestyle, awareness, crime, politics, commentary, comedy, and entertainment. Available on most streaming platforms. The KUAM Podcast Network. Subscribe and listen now. Platform morning show, The Link, just got a little more delicious with Feed Me Fridays. Chris, Sabrina, Jason, and the rest of the morning crew will take some time off each Friday to talk, taste, and tempt you with all the latest and greatest food and drinks on Guam. Old faves, new hits, and everything else we can put in our bellies. It's Feed Me Fridays on The Link, brought to you by King's Restaurants, Ruby Tuesday, Guam, and Devondale. Do you feel like you're missing out on something? Make life more rewarding with Pacific Points. Earn and redeem points for bill rebates and free load at IT&E, discounts on fuel at Shell, vouchers at Foodies, 
and United Mileage Plus miles. You can even pay with Pacific Points at it &E, Shell, and Foodies. Pacific Points. Do more, get more. The relationship between Guam and Manila, Philippines is undeniable as we share similar cultural traditions, history, and heritage with generations of Filipinos calling Guam home. KUAM presents a monthly look at the capital city featuring in-depth and engaging interviews on everything from medical tourism to new business and government leaders. Veteran newscaster Nestor Licanto delivers Beyond Our Borders. This special program is brought to you by KFC and the Medical City, where patients are partners. GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's, offers fully covered loading and unloading area with individual pin-coated gate and door access. Call us today at 648-7867 for more information. Get the job done the right way by getting the right stuff at East West Rental Center. With years of experience helping builders, we definitely got what you need. Call 646-1463 or visit us in Upper Tumon. Open Monday to Saturday from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. and on Sundays from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. the link is back here everybody the midpoint of the week and uh, certainly there's a lot going down uh in our friends at the legislature and everything they're in the middle of the budget hearings which means they're throwing a lot throwing around a lot of concepts a lot of numbers a lot of opinions and someone right in the middle of that uh by virtue of his role they're throwing as a minority around concepts jay huh? what they're throwing around concepts and what what do you no, say? Concepts and numbers and, and, and opinions about, you know, because we, we reported yesterday that they said, you know, senators now are looking at exactly what are the revenue projections uh, from the BPT. And oh. so now that they're. I thought they were just playing verbal jujitsu with Lester Carlson. That's, a, <laughs> that's, a, that's another way to put it. <laughs> nice sports analogy. But, right. But but certainly from, from his vantage point, um, Minority Leader uh, Chris Duenas has a lot to consider and everything. So he very graciously joins us now in the KOM News Zoom Room. Good morning, Senator. Good morning, Chris and Bree and Jason. And I'm going to say that I'm uh, team, team Steve Guerrero. <laughs> no, okay, nice. Pick a side. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Right off the. We were just talking about tiger sharks and everything like that. So certainly there are some sharks in the water, metaphorically, when it comes to this budget thing, right, Senator? I want to make a pronouncement on KUAM this morning. If the budget ceiling, if the BPT is raised by $50 million, I'm an automatic no on this budget. Mm. Let me tell you something, guys. The first question I asked Steve Guerrero, who I've worked with for over 18 years, I trust his numbers. The first thing I asked him was, your adopted revenue levels, does it reflect the governor's request and all agencies in terms of the ceilings? And he said, yes. I have no reason to doubt that and I have no reason to believe that we should raise the revenues by $50 million at this point. You know, this morning I was listening to Dave De La Sola. We should have had him <laughs> join the fiscal team because he's the most sober guy in the room right now, basically saying, look guys, in two weeks, this pool and F buck is over. That billion dollars injected into our economy is done. Thousands, hundreds of uh, uh, thousands of people, you know, out of jobs. Um, if you look at even nationwide now, the market today is down because consumer spending and spending even stateside has taken a much deeper dip than they thought. And we're still in the summertime. That's got to be reflective of the fact that even the people stateside that uh, are not going to be receiving PUA and FBUC and some of the government assistance and the stimulus is starting to wane that absolutely has to be reflective of spending power i do not see any scenario where uh you know the bpt 
is going to increase. You know, this one snapshot in July, Chris and Bree, what bothers me about that is if you look at, you had a bump in corporate and you had a bump in, in, in VPT, right? But this is right on the eve of the extended uh, tax season, right? We didn't have taxes due until I believe May 17th. So you had corporate and corporations that were paying their taxes and the like, probably to make sure they can get their business license and everything else going forward. And you had economic activity, yes, but let's be realistic here. Even when we do the government realignment, we based it on three consecutive months of the CRER dipping below the 3% threshold. Why would we take one snapshot? And by the way, Chris and Bree, you know, the, the special funds are down by $18 million. So even that $8 million bump in the general fund is dwarfed by a $10 million, uh, you know, that's a $10 million difference in terms of the loss in special funds. I asked that burn directly, straight on every one of those single uh, special funds. Where do you get the money? A lot of those special funds have debt service. For example, uh, the, the tourist attraction fund. We all know that we took out the hot bond for millions of dollars and we have to pay debt service um, through GBV and that has to be subsidized by the general fund. It's just beyond me. I'm shocked that, that, that the legislature would even think about raising the revenue. Hi. Um, well, how do your colleagues feel? On the, in the I know the Republican, the Republican caucus is, is pretty darn united on this one. We, we were all just shaking our heads yesterday when we started to hear some of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle saying, you know, they're going to take some of this optimistic view. You know, I like Steve Guerrero's uh, term, you know, prove me wrong. I've been doing this for a long time. Prove me wrong. We can come in anytime and raise revenues, Chris and Bree. That is nothing. That's the easiest thing to do. That's that's like uh, we were talking with Jason earlier. That's like going to Disneyland, right? <laughs> but reducing revenues, uh, that's like going to uh, have your tooth extracted, right? <laughs> so what, why would you do it? I mean, let's at least see. And another thing I'm really concerned about, we're basically, as far as I'm concerned, double appropriating uh, the EITC reimbursement. If you look at the schedule that's there in terms of how we're preparing for tax refunds, 74 million is the bottom line number. That's taking in consideration the reimbursement of EITC. And then no more than four lines down from that when we go into the language of the budget, when we've adopted the revenues, we're putting aside money for the, uh, the, uh, ex the uh, Center of Excellence for, med for medicine, right? For the hospital and all the other projects. We're putting aside 5 million for the prison. And then we get around to saying, okay, whatever is left over can go into tax refund account. It doesn't make any sense. A long time ago, the legislature used to do what was called an authorization. Authorization without an appropriation. That's what got the government of Guam in trouble before. That was stopped. You have to appropriate and you have to back it up with revenues. You don't authorize because if you don't have the money, it's not gonna come to be. And so, I think we should go, and I asked the panel this, I think we should go one full fiscal year with this EITC reimbursement and then sit down at the table because whether it's a reimbursement based on how we, you know, build the government, the federal government basically by saying, okay, we paid out this much, give us this much money this quarter, or whether it's a trust fund that's dropped on our lap, that's here's the full 55 uh, million, we don't know. That's prudent budgeting. Is budgeting from what you know, not from what you don't know. What about this Army Corps of Engineer uh, yeah. press conference you were in yesterday, uh, Senator? You know, I thought that was an excellent presentation. Um, you know, as we know in government, government does some things good, some things not so good. I think the Army Corps of Engineers, this is really one of their, you know, uh, their, their signature strengths. Um, they basically did this charrette, as they call it, um, for the Naval Hospital. They do it uh, nationwide in terms of as part of a, a planning process for you know, large uh, projects like this, large um, you know, CapEx projects. And I think it's definitely something worth taking a look at. I, I wanna thank the Congressman 
for being so gracious and inviting all of us senators uh, to sit down and, and listen to the proposal. Um, I think basically one thing I appreciated as well, because my question uh, to the Lieutenant Colonel was, is this a process that's basically standalone or is it tandem with what the jurisdictions are doing? And he said, it's absolutely tandem. He said, you've got your task force in place. You've got your planning tools that you have now. This is basically just an outside perspective on a large view on how we uh, go about um, you know, moving forward with large projects. And it's basically really solid technical assistance. One thing I think it also may provide for us, uh, Chris and Bree, is it may provide us a lot more legitimacy when we go in and ask for federal grants and additional resources uh, from the national government to, to work with us, particularly when it comes to the veterans area, right? We all know that the CBOC has been having a lot of difficulty and it probably would make sense to have a veterans type of clinic and outpatient stuff on a civilian hospital subsidized by the federal government. That was one of the signature things of the Trump administration when they came in, uh, you know, was to basically deal with a lot of the issues veterans were having uh, because of the, the long lines and the long waits in terms of government hospitals. And so they said, you know, look, go to the doctor outside and, uh, you know, send us the bill. And, and it really alleviated a lot of the pressure in terms of veterans health care and veterans needs, you know, even when it comes to behavioral, you know, uh, issues with regard to, uh, you know, the uh, difficulties that they have coming back from theater and the like. So I think that, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of great synergies that we can bring about. And I think having a, kind of the stamp of approval, if you will, of the Army Corps might be something we would want to do. What was the difference between like the governor's meeting and the congressman's press conference? They were invited. Well, <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't. I don't know how many more invitations the legislature of, as a whole wants to take to go downtown because uh, we all know what happened on the last one. Uh, we presented the plan and then thank you for the plan and uh, have a nice day. Put but that plan in the shredder. I, totally, totally. <laughs> Yeah, our plans look almost identical. Wait a minute, I won't show you my plan. But <laughs> anyways, so so basically, I think that um, uh, really uh, the difference was uh, we were engaging from the legislature and from the congressman's perspective on, you know, is this a complementary opportunity where, you know, maybe what I saw from the governor's perspective is, uh, you know, we'll consider it, but we're, you know, we're trotting forward. So, you know, that's the governor's prerogative, but I, I think it was more inclusive and uh, more open discussion on the possibilities when it came to the legislature and interacting with Army Corps. Hey, you know, but when you re read the release from the governor's office after that meeting with the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, it, it says that she's going to be in the next coming days uh formally submit a letter of engagement with the u.s army corps of engineers to assist with planning and oversight assistance with her vision for a medical center of excellence which she coined sagan hinemlu a place of healing Ooh. and it you know and it talks about this whole charrette um so i don't know it kind of sounds like well it kind of sounds like there was a competition to see who could be cooler with the army corps um uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the train is coming down the tracks, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you're looking at the congressman. This is what he does, right? He advocates for us in Congress. I mean, it, he, he, was, he was so instrumental in making sure, and in fact, he made the report yesterday that everything that he requested uh, from Guam in the infrastructure uh, proposal has been included. In, in, the, in the current bill that's being debated now uh, in Congress. So once again, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, get on board. Uh, the train's running down the tracks. I, I, think it's, I think it's a great thing. I was pretty much more talking about the level of engagement, right? So uh, if you, I was almost, uh, you know, Nestor was there, I think it was almost two hours, an hour and a half. And so it was really, um, I think the dialogue was excellent. The senators had a lot of key questions and um, and so I, for me, I mean, we could do a press release too. But I think if you just watch the interaction <laughs> and the recorded uh, meeting, you'll see that um, you know that that we uh, that we were very engaging and uh, and that we took it serious. And I'm not saying it wasn't taken serious, 
uh, on the other side. Um, but I'm just saying that uh, I think our engagement was very, uh, you know, at a high level. Well. Yeah, we're all looking uh, forward to see what's going to happen out of uh, all of that. Yeah, I'm just confused. You know, we got we got to admit. I mean, Chris, Bree, you're talking about. You know, right now we're te we're testing what herd immunity is, right? Mm. We 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 know that COVID. I mean, we I'm sure we would trade COVID. Uh, you know, for for not having this billions of dollars coming into Guam, like you said earlier, Chris, it's a blessing, right? But one thing we do have to say is we certainly are at the table right now when it comes to the federal government and getting things done. I mean, if we've got another massive infusion uh, on the infrastructure bill, I mean, Guam is in just such a different place. And, and, and maybe that means optimism for fiscal year 2023, but not 2022. <laughs> but we have got to admit that we certainly have been a part of the family when it's come to this uh, pandemic relief. Just not the Guam family. Uh, well, you know, one other thing that I didn't mention about the, uh, the unprecedented nature at which the governor has had over $3 billion at her disposal going forward in the last uh, 20 months but now we also are budgeting whereby we have a $603 million savings account sitting right next to that budget. And this is why I'm concerned as well. If we raise the levels, Chris and Bree, there's no reason to exercise fiscal discipline. You know, having been in government as a director and at the legislature, you know, there's one thing the Office of Finance and, or the, the BBMR does as soon as the budget passes. They give you the good news and the bad news. The good news is your ceiling was adopted and you've got your full budget. The bad news is you've got a 15% reserve. So that's what level you get to spend there. If you have overinflated budgets, you don't have to worry about that because the thought of a deficit isn't hounding you. But when you have very conservative numbers, you have to exercise strong and prudent fiscal controls. So one of the things I ran on, guys, when we were sitting here and you were interviewing me you know, over a year ago was being a fiscal hawk, but also taking care of the priorities. I, most of us on our side of the aisle cannot believe how much customs has been treated like a stepchild as far as we're concerned. We keep asking, are you going to use ARP funds to subsidize their budget? Because they can't even pay their rent. We found out during the interview with Lester that um, you know they're getting rent deferment up at the airport. That's how they're surviving. They're not paying rent. I asked him if he reported that um, during the time he was doing the refunding over in Washington. He said, absolutely, I mean, in San Francisco, he said, absolutely, disclosure is king. Well, then if he disclosed that a revenue source had fallen off because they're deferment in rent, I thought to myself, maybe because, you know, Chris and Bree were able to get uh, Mr. Kanata to say they're getting $20 million from ARP. So that makes sense, right? If you report it also, the governor's committed $20 million, so that revenue loss is not a big deal. Maybe that ended up being why we were still favorable. But you know, every time that the airport has gone down to the legislature, and every time we've talked about revenue, you can't touch the revenue, because the minute you do anything to, to, to take away any of the revenues, it triggers a, a, you know, a, a bond. You know, the bondholders start taking a look at it, and they can call those bonds at any time. So this is, this is how much and how important it is for us to know what the intentions of the governor is for the ARP. You know, I would be in favor right now of passing a three month budget. And we come back after the first quarter, just to say maybe this budget changes because of your plan. But right now, I am team Steve Guerrero, and that's the only budget I'm voting for. There you go, thank you, Senator. Uh, hey, thanks a lot, guys. Wait, 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 I wanted to ask uh, uh, your thoughts because we, we didn't get a chance to ask the speaker oh yeah, yeah, yeah. about uh, the governor um, requesting that the legislature, the ju judiciary has already done it, uh, follow her lead in implementing a vaccination uh, mandate within the legislative branch. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so first and foremost, my office is fully vaccinated. Um, 
these are all individual offices and the you know the, the control really is under um, the majority and the leadership there but mm -hmm. I think the speakers handled this well you know I think she's basically uh, you know said that look um, let's let's look at our team internally um, you know most of these government agencies are right up against the 80 percent uh, you know, threshold. And like I said, we're testing herd immunity right now. We haven't even discussed, there's not even a figure on how many people can report that they're COVID survivors, which means they have a, a, a less likelihood of any, uh, you know, of, of getting reinfected as well. So I think the legislature's position right now is a, is a responsible position. Um, but I know that also there are internal to offices, you know, they have their own protocols. You know, you, you can also let an individual work from home right now if you want to like we were doing during COVID if they have some issues with regard to getting uh, the vaccine but I am absolutely not an anti-vaxxer the vaccine as 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 as, as uh, Doc said you know has absolutely saved us in this situation we would be in a complete world of hurt right now with this variant and with with the with the spread rate that we have uh, I think we would be in really big trouble if, if we didn't have, you know, 80% of our adult population eligible. So, but I still think the legislature is taking a, a, a very responsible uh, uh, look at it. I know that many offices are like mine. Their staff are fully vaccinated, and um, and I, I think I think we're being responsible. Our protocols are really strong, you know, in terms of uh, how we conduct session. So, I think the legislature is on on the right side of this issue. And also before. Uh uh, we let you go. I uh, wanted to see if you had any comments with the governor uh, rescinding and then creating her own all rise program and, you know, the language that was in the executive order basically, uh, you know, trashing Bill 75 and yeah. Bill 164, um, calling it incomprehensible, mm. defies all logic uh, that the Guam legislature would pass uh, conflicting bills. Uh, uh, she said the legislature ha was, has proven ill-equipped to pass a law that creates and allows the executive branch to implement a program that gives our people direct aid and also complies with federal mandates regarding the use of ARP funds. What I don't, un yeah. What I don't understand is with that pronouncement, why don't she just veto them and send them back so we can decide which one we want to override? You know, <laughs> we can send her one back. That we can only override one. I mean, come on. Let's be real. That's not a way to work with us. You know, uh, we we had two well-intentioned bills. The reason why two bills came out, because I was fighting to make sure it was one bill. The reason why two bills came out, guys, is because there is a difference in the legislature as to whether or not to raise the threshold. That really all, that was the only material difference. Everything else was raising the cap to make sure that it's not uh, Hunger Games. Uh, first in, first out. Sorry, thirty million is done. You know, you thousand Oops. people don't get it. Man. And 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 the other and the other thing that we did, you know, basically is is both bills lightened the restrictions. Yeah. Jim's bill, uh, Senator Moyne's bill, you know, co-sponsored by myself and Tony Ada, wanted to give a little bit more money to the folks. I can't tell you how many times I'm walking in the store, heading down to the boat, going anywhere that I'm going, and people are saying. Hey, did the Rise Act, you know, get, did, 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 was there some additional money in there? I said, well, we're trying, you know, but if the governor doesn't want to do that, that's fine. Like I said, just veto them both, send it to us, and maybe we might, we might override one of them. Oh, but I mean, but, Senator, you know, the, 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 I mean, the real reason why you guys introduced those bills is because the governor was complaining that um, the law didn't allow her to do this or to do that. So she was holding up the law as kind of like her excuse. And you guys went and did this dance and passed these uh, bills with a sense of urgency to get this money. It's just a whole game. I, don't, I mean, she duped you guys into playing a game. So you guys passed these bills, and then she's like, oh, I don't like it. No, I'm going to do my own thing. Right, but also in the executive order, as she, you know, she talked about those bills. They don't, um, they're not ev even in compliance with the interim guidelines uh, provided by uh, the U.S. Treasury for assistance to households or populations facing negative economic impacts due to COVID-19. Yeah, but Bree, how, how, how do you say that when you don't even have the application process in place? Mm -hmm. How do you know, Chris, Bree, myself, maybe we're I'm not eligible, no, but I can tell you right now, I'm gonna leave the house and drive down the road and I'm gonna see a lot of eligible people on the way down there. So I get a little irritated with, well, you know, not in compliance, what, how do you know? You haven't even done the application process yet. 
they made the application process so arduous that that that, that you wouldn't even know mm -hmm. you know so i mean come on I, I say open up the program do what you got to do let people apply and then you be the one at revenue tax to say who's eligible and not eligible right. yeah. i mean i know that there's, i know there's competing media right but i mean i just got to say this i think the post editorial hit the nail on the head a couple of days ago it straight out said why can we do uh, car giveaways? Why can we do all these wonderful programs? If we really want to do them, we can stand them up in a second. Yeah. But if we don't want to do something, I tell you, if football season, preseason isn't on now, the goalpost just keeps moving. Yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, yeah, and that's the thing is the governor, I mean, for whatever reason, didn't want to implement the rise. And that's so obvious. And all of this uh, subterfuge, if you will, has just been one big fat distraction that she's using to demonize the legislature and to, I, I think to further prove her case that you guys aren't even needed i mean she's the only branch of government is the way i look at how she uh, sees it it's unfortunate really because no one person has all the great ideas we said that the whole time i mean come on talk about politicizing we, we've said it the whole time we don't need the bills you know the, the the original rise act is not even a public law anymore the minute she put pen to paper and did the executive order we were out of it the only reason why we came back into it is we were in drug into it because yeah. every single time there was a problem with the rise act it was because of that pesky legislature so well then we got to work and fixed it you know, but you can't have it both ways. You either want to do it or you don't want to do it. And don't don't blame us. I mean, at the end of the day, this is uh, her program now with this other new executive order, and the cap is still going to be $30 million. So if you are eligible, we definitely wish you the best of luck. Yeah, because good luck. Because, again, it, it is first in, first out. May the best person win. And she are expanded you ready? the eligibility. So yeah. the people that this was initially intended for, mm -hmm. the people in the private sector that didn't have a job, that was severely economically impacted, you're going to be competing yep. with uh, the, all the GovGuam employees and, and retirees. So really, <laughs> I don't even know how this is going to work. Uh, Revan Tax is going to be meeting with the Mayor's Council of Guam this afternoon because they're not even sure. Yeah, like I said, you know, if, if we want to stand up a VAX program, we can do it in a minute. You know, free car, $10,000, whatever else we got to do. But this one, mm, rocket science. Mm -hmm. All right, Senator. Good luck uh, during budget today. Have fun. Hey guys, thanks. I hope uh, go go team Steve Guerrero. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> a day. Ah, a day. Hey, it's nine oh nine. We're coming back with public health and uh, acting environmental public health officer. Uh, she's also the acting head of Division of Environmental Health, Leilani Navarro. Um, also, uh, Major Anton Uggen. As there is a. Um, a gentleman who was uh, allegedly involved in trafficking major amounts of meth into the island has uh, been extradited. He's on Guam now, so we'll catch up on that and everything else uh, going on behind bars. And then uh, Jay's got a great interview with the American Cancer Society. Is there um, uh, breaking out their luminary uh, uh, display? And we'll tell you all about that. And everything else coming up on the link it's 909 good morning on august 28th join us as we illuminate hope at the american cancer society relay for life luminaria exhibit at the fdms phoenix center from 10 a.m to 5 p.m witness the illuminous display of lights a representation of our love and respect for those who have battled cancer we will remember those who have lost to cancer honor those who have beaten this enemy and support those who are currently enduring the treatments for cancer the KUAM Podcast Network is back and on demand, featuring a great variety of podcasts from our island and region, including culture, lifestyle, awareness, crime, politics, commentary, comedy, and entertainment. Available on most streaming platforms. The KUAM Podcast Network. Subscribe and listen now. KUAM TV has been on the air for 65 years. 65 years of growing, changing, and adapting to the needs of our local community. 65 years of making you smile, laugh, and cheer, and being there for you in times of tears and heartbreak and learning to heal together. We've kept you on the edge of your seats, been a trusted source for you to turn to, weathered many storms together, and celebrated life's 
big moments. And now at 65, we celebrate all the firsts we brought you over the years and all the firsts that lie ahead as our world changes. KUAM-TV, celebrating 65 years of firsts on Guam. Say hello to the First Hawaiian Bank mobile app. Got a question about your finances? You've come to the right place. Bring all your accounts together, even those that aren't with us, and see the big picture, right down to the smallest detail. Unlock powerful tools like Insights and Money Map that help you save time and take control of your finances. When you connect accounts with the First Hawaiian Bank mobile app, it all starts with yes. The relationship between Guam and Manila, Philippines is undeniable as we share similar cultural traditions, history, and heritage with generations of Filipinos calling Guam home. KUAM presents a monthly look at the capital city featuring in-depth and engaging interviews on everything from medical tourism to new business and government leaders. Veteran newscaster Nestor Licanto delivers Beyond Our Borders. This special program is brought to you by KFC and The Medical City, where patients are partners. KUAM's multi-platform morning show, The Link, just got a little more delicious with Feed Me Fridays. Chris, Sabrina, Jason, and the rest of the morning crew will take some time off each Friday to talk, taste, and tempt you with all the latest and greatest food and drinks on Guam. Old faves, new hits, and everything else we can put in our bellies. It's Feed Me Fridays on The Link, brought to you by King's Restaurants, Ruby Tuesday Guam, and Devondale. Do you feel like you're missing out on something? Make life more rewarding with Pacific Points. Earn and redeem points for bill rebates and free load at IT&E, discounts on fuel at Shell, vouchers at Foodies, and United Mileage Plus Miles. You can even pay with Pacific Points at IT&E, Shell, and Foodies. Pacific Points. Do more, get more. Uno Mixed. We're mixing it up on the last Thursday of every month with a look at lifestyle, entertainment, food, and so much more on the stations, networks, and digital platforms of KUAM Communications. Uno Mixed is presented to you by Docomo Pacific, Better Together, and Pepsi. Get the job done the right way by getting the right stuff at East West Rental Center. With years of experience helping builders, we definitely got what you need. Call 646-1463 or visit us in Upper Tumon. Open Monday to Saturday from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. and on Sundays from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. A new musical competition series from NBC focusing on original music is in the works and they're looking for contestants. American Song Contest is modeled after the hit European phenomenon Eurovision, which has produced some of the most talented performers the world has ever known. The show's looking for individuals and bands from all types of music to find an act in every state and territory, including representatives from Guam and the CNMI. Go online to americansongsubmissions.com to enter and submit your original song submissions now. Must be 16 years or older and groups cannot exceed six people. Additional conditions apply. So apply today and get ready to rep our island on the national stage. American Song Contest debuts next spring on NBC. GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's, offers fully covered loading and unloading area with individual pin-coated gate and door access. Call us today at 648-7867 for more information. The way I was talking to you the other day Reminded me of when we used to date That I could skate it out Got me feeling so sad where we know how So I picked hey, good morning. up Morning. Happy birthday to our good friend uh, Joel Cotto over at Guam Barbecue Company. Tuna. Hey, Happy birthday. My, cla my classmate, and not, not a lot of people know this, but you know, Joel has made his mark as you know as a barbecue extraordinaire. He's a marketing major. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. And right and right after for right GVB. after you yeah right after you were G, he was a DVB for a lot of years. Really really smart guy. Yeah. I mean definitely markets that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. good. That good food. Yeah, yeah. His, his his success his success not at all a surprise. He was he's a real real joy to have to as a classmate to work on projects. Yeah, I mean he's been doing the cooking thing for so many years. I remember way back, God, so many years ago. I don't want to say how many because it's embarrassing, but I remember uh, he would cook for you know people's 
like Thanksgiving or, or whatever, and it's still doing that now, up to now. Uh, 916, Wednesday, August 18th. Good morning. Uh, let's head into the KUAM News Zoom Room where we have Leilani Navarro of the Department of Public Health and Social Services. Uh, she oversees the Division of Environmental Health as well as uh, uh, she's the Acting Environmental Public Health Officer. I'm surprised you don't have uh, two heads, Lonnie, since you're wearing so many hats. Well, actually, I'm the acting administrator for the Bureau of Inspection Enforcement. Our chief is still Tom Nadeau, so um, he's uh, actually um, back uh, to the to his office from um, a court trial. So um, he's there. He's still the head. Right on. Why did I just promote you by accident? I think you did. <laughs> Tom's like, I got to call the director. What happened? I didn't get the memo. Uh, but, you know, I asked uh, Director Art to get you on uh, because, uh, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, God, I hope I'm right. You guys are responsible for enforcing the mask mandate? Yes, we are. Since the start of the pandemic, we've been assigned to enforce the governor's executive orders uh, to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Uh, as well as the any uh, public health guidance memo that comes out uh, in relation to that executive order. Okay, so uh, do you know how many tickets you guys have actually issued for the mask uh, mandate? And I know you, you have cited some people uh, as a result of just COVID inspections you did at some establishments over the last year, right? So are you um, asking since the start of the pandemic or just for this recent uh, executive order when we reach the 80 percent um, uh, vaccination rate? How about both? Sure. I think we oh, I yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No worries. Okay. Yeah. So let me start with the um, current executive order, which uh, requires um, that uh, all, everyone wears masks unless they're exempted, uh, such as when they have medical conditions. Uh, so far, the executive order and our guidance memo, which came out in July 29th, we have not um, uh, cited anyone. All of meaning, although we have received complaints and have acted upon complaints of uh, people not wearing their mask, when our inspectors uh, go to that uh, facility, the complaint was not observed. Everyone were wearing their masks properly, and um, they they were abiding by the uh, current uh, guidance memo. But for since the start of the pandemic. I think we need to have Jason take a look at your laptop. Okay, I think uh, so since February 19 up to um, June, which is the current data that we have, I actually July 26, 2021, which is the data that we got from the Traffic Violation Bureau, which um, compiles all the citation tickets that we've issued. We have 17 um, violations. So these uh, range from not following um, the social distancing mandates, congregating, uh, not wearing uh, face masks, so this is a mix of everything that were uh, all the restrictions that were in place since the uh, the pandemic started. Is that February nineteenth, as in twenty 2020 twenty or twenty twenty one? I'm sorry, twenty twenty one. Okay, I, yeah, my apologies. Uh, the only data that I have actually starts uh, February 18, 2021. 
to July uh, 2021. Uh, July, actually July 6, 2021. Mm -hmm. So there's... Um, Seventeen mm -hmm. uh, citation tickets that were issued. Uh, Leilani, can you give us the uh, dollar amount associated with these citations? Not necessarily what was paid, but the fines that come with these seventeen. Sure. Um, so, if it's a business, it's uh, if it's the first violation, it starts uh, at a thousand. So uh, for. Uh, but usually it's only business that we've cited, not individuals. So it's 1,000 per violation. And then for succeeding violations, uh, it goes up to uh, 5,000. Does GPD report the citations that they issue to public health? They, yes, they, no, they actually report it to the Traffic Violation Bureau. I see. So, uh, there's nothing here on my record that shows uh, uh, GPD issuing officers. So these are all um, DPHSS employees. Mm -hmm. So um, I can go ahead and ask uh, Ms. Roberto of uh, the TVB, which who is the TVB clerk that um, gives us this information. And, and these um, tickets, that are issued is this just from when someone calls in and makes a complaint or so previously we we own because of uh staffing challenges we've only been able to respond based on the complaints that we received but um like since the uh, 80 percent have been re uh, vaccination rate have been reached we've been um, tasked to do spot checks. Mm -hmm. So on a daily basis, there's one to four uh, inspectors that go out and uh, checks these uh, establishments uh, that are populated, or if we see, if we uh, hear of any event or gathering. So we just want to make sure that we're there and we're reminding people to uh, wear their masks properly and uh, wash their hands and make sure that the surfaces are clean and disinfected. And if it's required, they need to maintain the contact logs. So this is a requirement for all eating and drinking establishments, for schools, for uh, childcare facilities and cosmetology establishments. Did you guys ever receive any uh, complaints or, or concerns? We had the chief of police on and he was talking about uh, down in Tumon a lot of uh, people going around with masks and that I believe uh, he was saying some hotel workers had some issues with uh, trying to get people to wear masks in the lobby. Was this just something that, that GPD took care of on the scene or were you guys uh, activated to go down and issue any uh, citations? Well, we were actually called um, two consecutive weekends until um, San Sunday, just this Sunday, uh, because uh, we received complaints that indeed in the um, hotels, people were not wearing their masks properly. So our team went out, we scouted all the uh, hotels in Tumon. We also did inspections of um, GPO uh, food court and the mall itself. Uh, however, all the uh, places that our inspectors went to, everyone was wearing their masks. So no citations were issued. So basically what happens is someone's not wearing a mask right or whatever, and then the staff will say, hey, can you put that on? And they put it on, and when you guys show up, everything's okay. Yes. That's good. Yes, that's right. We, of course, our um, aim is really to educate and work with um, everyone to uh, ask for their cooperation in ensuring that they're following the mandates, I mean, the executive orders. Mm -hmm. Does uh, your uh, division also approve, like if somebody wants to have a, a, a ball, for example, do you guys have to approve their plans on how to ensure that they, uh, you know, contain um, or prevent the spread of COVID? As, uh, Sabrina, you're talking about if someone has an event? Yes, yes. Does okay. it have to be approved so by your, your division? 
Yeah. So we used to do that. However, uh, after the issuance of the PHSS guidance memo 2021-18, with this, which does not require the any facility to submit mitigation plans except for schools. So we have not um, received any uh, proposal, a mitigation proposal for a special event uh, because it's not required. Wow. But we are, uh, the only requirement uh, is for the schools to uh, submit an in-class operating plan. Um, Lonnie? So, so basically, if I want to go and have a huge birthday party or fundraiser for 200 people in a ballroom, I could just do what I want, right? Just as long as everybody's wearing a mask. Correct. Okay. Because uh, the all most of the restrictions have been list, lifted, right. Right. so mm -hmm. there's no more uh, uh, social distancing requirements or uh, occupancy limits in any uh, event. So, yeah, they can do that as long as they uh, wear their mask properly. They have um, uh, adequate hand washing facilities, and they're able to clean and disinfect the facility on a frequent basis. So, so it's party times. Wide <laughs> open, guys. Wide open. I mean, you know. Clearly, in, if you see the numbers, right? We're in a surge, but, you know, do what you do. But, um, you know, that's why we are trying to go out as much as we can to check and ensure that everyone are, is at least wearing the mask properly. What's the protocol right now, Lonnie, um, with a business establishments? Like, what do they have to have in place right now? Temperature check? What, what's the protocol? No, that's, that's actually, you know, and that's never been a requirement. The only requirement right now is first and most importantly is that they uh, everyone wears a mask except when they're eating, drinking, or actively engaged in uh, physical activity or they have a medical uh, issue. Um, this is uh, in keeping with the CDC recommendation for uh, the uh, wearing of masks. Also, they need to have uh, to provide adequate hand washing facilities for their employees and for um, the customers. A third, they need to uh, maintain contact logs, um, which is a requirement for four types of facilities, which are the eating and drinking establishments, the schools, childcare facilities, and the cosmetology establishments, which are the uh, beauty salons and barber shops. And then the fourth one is they have to have a policy in place and they're able to implement uh, frequent cleaning and disinfection of their establishment. So those are the four requirements uh, as of um, the current guidance memo. And if uh, I walk into an establishment and they're not doing that, call public health or call 311 yes, or call... Yeah. What is the number? Yes, you can. They can call three one one, and three one one will um, forward the complaint to us, and we will address it right away because that's our COVID um, mitigation is our priority right now. All right, thank you so All much. All right, Lonnie. You're very welcome. Right on. So, um, okay. I saw the inspection reports. It looks like everybody's uh, following the guidelines. No, I didn't see any citations or anything. That's right. Well, there's no guidelines, though. Oh, uh, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm talking just kidding, about yeah, her, yeah, the one. The COVID. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Lonnie, I wanted to ask, though, uh, so we, we talk about one of the requirements is that these certain types of businesses have to keep the log, right, of who comes. Correct. But we had Chima mm -hmm. on, and he was saying that b they were trying to contact trace a bar, and the owner of the bar didn't want to say or show the um, contact tracer the... Uh, log because i guess people had their chakma there or whatever uh so do you come across that kind of thing a lot or uh not currently but uh we've been actually starting last night we've been going out and checking the bars again so we'll definitely be um uh education educating the uh operators bar operators to make sure that they have these logs well, it's not just having them, it's also them showing it to you guys. 
right? And being in yes. compliance. Yes, um, it's uh, the. The requirement is actually they have to maintain the contact logs uh, with it uh, for 30 days. So what happens uh, in the event of this, like the men's karaoke bar where they were doing the contact tracing and the owner was uh, uncooperative? Is there like a fine associated with that kind of thing? Yes, there 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 will be a fine uh, available. So, but but of course we would have to verify um, the the um, you know the what actually happened well, well, I mean, we Chima. have our inspectors have to uh see like uh if indeed they don't have the logs mm -hmm. and if um if they do they need to show it to uh public health okay thank you lonnie thank you you're welcome stay safe Bye. we'll see you take it easy you too. appreciate your hard work 931 uh let's keep it in the k way of news zoom room where he's back from and he's Lee. got a great virtual background, guys. Hey. Yeah, hey. Yeah. Wow. Very slick. Major Anton Ogden, uh, the Department of Corrections. <laughs> Goes really nice with that shirt, Major. Yeah. Well, I feel like you're a part of the link team now. He is. <laughs> <laughs> he's getting a kick out of it. <laughs> he's like, uh, ask me a hard question now. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, I'm going to be asking the questions today. Uh, uh, you like it. Yeah. <laughs> How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Welcome home. Uh, yeah, it's good to be home. So you're off island. You did your tour. Tell us about uh, what you were. What, what were your takeaways? So we we uh, as you know, DOC is working on their uh, comprehensive uh, facilities master master plan in an effort to hopefully uh, uh, build a new facility. So one of that process was to go off island and, and visit, uh, 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 we wanted to visit more, but we got at least two uh, facilities, one in Ohio that is currently under construction. It's in uh, Franklin County, Ohio. Uh, so we got we got a chance to spend several days with them uh, walking their facility, it's under construction. They're hoping to open that facility by early next year. Um, so a lot of the construction is, is done, it's a, uh, they're planning for a 3,000 bed, uh, 3, bed facility. It's, they're doing the same concept we are doing, basically a phase approach to the project. So phase one and two of their project hopefully will be done by next year. Anyway, we got to walk with them uh, on their current design, um, met, sat down with them on their process on how they came up with their square footage and how they're gonna be uh, operating that prison. And we got a, a lot of good takeaways. Uh, our consultant who's helping us with the master plan was there. It was me, uh, the consultant, and of course, our deputy director, Robert Camacho. And uh, we spent like three days in their facility just walking around and talking to them about their process. We learned a lot. Some of the stuff we've already had on our plate and had ideas in our, in our head of how we wanted our facility to look. And a lot of it just confirmed that we were kind of heading in the right direction. Uh, the, the benefit of going with them, for example, is in their process, they visited over 50 different jails uh, back there as they were doing their process. Uh, a lot easier for them because they can travel just within the state and other states. But we took a, we were able to use their 50 jail experience and, and take away some good things from them. Uh, and after that, we uh, went over to Saginaw, Michigan, where there is a jail there that was recently been operational now about one year. And so we got, and it's a 511 bed facility. It cost them about 30 million for that one, 37 million, and about 37 million. And so we got to see the actual jail in operation and uh, sat down with their, their sheriff and their staff and went over their process. And we got a lot of good takeaways. We even asked them, for example, now that it's operational and you designed it this way, what would you change? if you had a chance to redesign your vicinity and they gave us a lot of good advice on how to change certain things or what they would have done differently now that it's operational and they learned, you know, learned a little bit more about their vicinity. So all in all, it was a very good trip. Uh, our uh, consultant is putting all this together. We've uh, had several meetings and uh, we're hoping by the end of the month, uh, we'll have a final product to present to the governor. And with this master plan, uh, we can now move to the next phase that when we get an architect, we, we know what we want. We kind of know already what we want. Square footage, height of the cells, 
how the design is going to be, and we're going to hand that off to the architect uh, and, and work with them on develop now putting all this, these conceptual ideas into an actual plan that can be uh, cost estimated and then eventually bid out so we can start the project. So, uh, you know, it, it has come a long way and I think we're continuously moving forward. So we're doing our part on our side to hopefully get this and, and now uh, once it's all done, of course, we have to rely on the legislature and the, the government to uh, identify the funding to move it for move this project farther. Okay. Um, so and it was a good trip. And what's the name of the contractor again? Uh, his Consultant? name is Dave Rogers. Right, uh, the company. Uh, information to energy. Information to energy. Yeah. <coughs> and so, a part I thought a part of the DOI funding was for uh, the company the consultant to conduct an assessment of DOC. Uh, did they provide? Yes, that, y yes uh, Sabrina, that is all part of this, uh, the comprehensive master plan when he gets, when he submitted. So there's different phases. There's like 14 phases to this project. And uh, for example, phase, phase one, I believe is the, uh, I can recall is the uh, population projection. So they look at our population past, uh, present and future. Uh, there is a phase there for the assessment of current current buildings, uh, which is already done. That was done already. Uh, the particular off island was, I think, phase 12 of the project, benchmarking. Uh, we, like I said, this whole process is is taking us uh, quite a long time. We've sat down with Guam behavioral staff, Guam GMH staff, asking them what they need, what's their assessment, what what if we were to get a new facility, what would they like to see in that facility. Uh, we sat down with all the, the officers, a bunch of officers, about how things would operate, and and of course, in a, you know, with this new city, we would obviously have to change some of our policies and procedures on how we operate. Um, and but there's still a lot more work to be done. But yes, all of that, like you said, the assessment is all going to be in the report. So, but are you able to just kind of give us an idea what what was in that the, the current assessment of DOC? I mean, we know it's a pretty old. Um, well, um, so he came in and checked out, for example, post 18. And, you know, that's one of our housing units that is actually the very first jail that was built in here in this facility in 1960s. And he recommended that building be condemned. Uh, he recommended that that building, the condition, the plumbing, the, uh, just the entire infrastructure, the whole building needs to be condemned. Also, post five is not so good either. Uh, there's a lot of issues with leaking and plumbing and electrical, again, because of the natural wear and tear. And so even that, he recommend that building being demolished. Uh, and, and, and part of our plan is actually to take that building out and that will become part of the new parking lot in the future, right? And of course the domes, those are temporary domes. Those are not lifelong structures. Uh, post six, got a few more years in there. We, we, we did some locks upgrade and some things in there upgrading it. Uh, post seven, we also did some upgrades on the roof and, and stuff. So those were still pretty much okay. Uh, post 16 is the building we built in probably 1998. Uh, that still got, got some good useful years, although it has some deterioration on the outside of uh, uh, erosion and the corrosion of the metal and stuff. But uh, yeah, he, he did you know say some of the buildings just need to go. Some of them just need to go. They're, they're not usable. Uh, and again, our our approach to this project is going to be in a phase approach. So we will not be able to build this prison overnight, one big one big build. It'll have to come in different phases. Our master plan is for 80 years, right? So phase one and two and three are, are basically the biggest part of this project. Um, phase four, five, and six go out into the year uh, all the way up, uh, you know, up 30 years out. You know, to, to add on to the facility. But as we build the first uh, first three phases, you want to plan for how you're going to build in the future. So you want to make sure all the conduits, all the, the the lines for future future electronics and all that are put in in the initial phase of the project. So there's still, like I said, a lot of work. Uh, a lot of this will be hammered out more once we get an architect on board and sit down with them and saying, this is what we want, this is what we need. You know, now we got to put it together. So uh, I'm very happy with the overall pro progress. And again, it only cost us the federal grant of 250000 
to, to get this, you know, this Not part, right? Yeah. We, we cannot build a new prison unless we have a plan. Right. Bottom line, unless we know what we want, we can't move forward. So is, uh, is the plan we know to, what we want. is the plan to Sorry? build it? Is, is the plan to build this new facility or the first three phases on DOC's current property? Yes, 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 it is. Okay. And, and we looked at that for several reasons. One, you know, we understand if we try to go back out in the community and find a new location, we're going to get resistance. There's no doubt about it. We're going to get resistance and we're going to spend two years fighting with the community and then all the other EPA requirements and all those other things that need to come with that. And we felt we have enough man up here that we can strategically put this new facility while, main, while running the current prison. Right? And as we finish these phases, complete phases, we can start moving inmates around into the new facility. And one of the bigger, the big side of this, uh, Sabrina, was we want to move out of the Ganyan, right? So phase one, of course, will, will allow us to remove all those detainees down in the Ganyan up to Manila, right? And, and so that was also one of our goals is to get out of the Ganyan. And this, this project, phase one, will actually address that. And then as we move forward, we, we add on the new buildings and, and over the course of several years, we can eventually start moving inmates around and get rid of the older buildings down the road. Okay. What about Andrew Manabusan? <laughs> uh, according to our records, he is here. He's in our custody. He's on a federal here. charge. That's and, all that, yeah. that's all the only information we get is right. that. I think Bree uh, has some information. Major, I mean, uh, Bree, can you just. What, so what is his background? What case is he involved with? Just to refresh our memory. He was busted in uh, California, I believe it was in June, yeah. uh, for mailing a package to Guam containing, I want to say it's more than 3,000 uh, gross grams of meth. I could be wrong. It could be over 1,000. But anyway, it's a significant the amount of drugs of uh, through the mail. And uh, the package ended up uh, being received uh, by a former DOC officer and a p former police officer. Jose Ananich. Right. And so his case was sealed. So we cannot even look at it. Andrew Manabusin's case isn't sealed. And so that's how we found out about um, the connection. And so he was extradited back to Guam, or he was supposed to have been extradited back to Guam. We've all been waiting for the past couple of months. Mm. They've scheduled hearings in the district court. Um, and it's been postponed, and so now it's expected to officially happen this morning uh, because uh, he is now on Guam. And so Tyler right. uh, is actually covering that hearing, right. um, which yeah. gets underway, I believe, at 10.15 this morning. So then morning. Uh, he allegedly mailed this package to Guam, and it was uh, picked up allegedly by mm -hmm. Jose Ananich, and then mm -hmm. he allegedly took it back to his house. And He was uh, found in a container office type situation. Something. So I guess he has a container office type situation <laughs> at his house and right. law enforcement showed up and he was allegedly attempting to burn the package in a drum, in the tunky, right? Yes, ice burns, guys. Newsflash. Um, and then also connected with this case, I want to say like it was ATF or something. They seized like a whole armory from um, Jose Ananich, right? It was just a bunch of guns and... And rifles and, and I think some... What are they call bullets and stuff. Bullets, yeah. <laughs> pew pews, a lot of pew pews. <laughs> uh, so there's your background, and now Mr. Metabusin is on island behind bars at your facility, Major. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. All right. Down in the Ganyo. Is he going to be transported down to district court? Uh, usually the U.S. Marshals take care of that. Oh, okay. Can you get him to bring him through the front? <laughs> uh. Stopped it. Sorry. No, that, that, that's uh, the U.S. Marshals. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, I'm just checking. I don't. I don't. I don't coordinate the transport there. I got you. I know. Okay. Uh, how about um? Uh, I know you can't really speak about Manabusin too much. So what what's uh, going on with vaccinations up at the uh, DOC? So uh, let me get my notes here because I have some notes right here in front of me. So as of now, we have. We have vaccinated on the, as far as the prisoners, 95% of the prisoners have been vaccinated. Um, that'll be about 546. Our current population today is 700 and, I mean, uh, 575. Out of that, out of the 575, 546 are vaccinated. 
And then on the officer side, the staff, not just all staff officers, but staff, we're also about 95%. We have 197 active staff members. Five of them are on uh, uh, long-term leave, like military deployment and some medical leave. So I'm not counting them. So out of the 197 active, about 95% of them, uh, or 187, I believe, are vaccinated. So we got about 10 more, I think, that are not vaccinated of the active. But also in addition, we have our Guam Behavioral staff that are here and our GMA staff that are assigned here, they too are all vaccinated. Uh, and so we're just gonna work on our 10, our, our well, 10 officers. I think out of the 10, some of them are currently are in the process of getting their first vaccination or, or working towards getting vaccinated. You haven't had any positive cases up there, right? No, no, okay. not, not since uh, November of last year. Okay. Wow. That's good. <laughs> Okay, Major, we got to run. Are you good, Bree? Any uh, officers trying to smuggle in crystal meth or any other type of contraband? Uh, No, not that I'm aware of now, no. Nobody's been busted for that. Okay. Any drones dropping stuff over the fence? Anything Um, thrown over? You know, we we did a few weeks ago when I was off island, I think. we, We did have a few incidents where... Some drones were located over, uh, were, were seen over the vicinity. Uh, I think about three different times. I'm not sure if it's the neighborhood drones or, uh, you know, it's just people playing out with their drones. But there have been some sightings of several drones, drone, drone going over our vicinity. Uh, you know, we, we uh, I understand too. This was supposed to be a no-fly zone, but we're still working on that to figure yeah. out uh, yeah. where we're at with that. But uh, you know, we just gotta. Keep diligent. We're not sure. We're not sure about. It. I mean, we do live in not too far from neighborhoods, so there could be some family members. How does that work, uh, Major? Because I know that for for hotels and military bases, um, and I know specifically for like military property, they have some kind of like per, they have these things in place where if the drone crosses over the property line, they, it just yeah. dies and falls down. But, but what does that take to get that kind of designation for a DOC? Well, we are looking into that. Uh, we are looking into that right now, uh, working with Homeland and uh, some other agencies on trying to see how we can address this this issue. So we don't have a solution yet, but uh, you know we are we are working on it. So in the meantime, you're just going to be shooting those drones out of the sky, right? Anytime they fly over the prison. No, no, no. We cannot. Uh, <laughs> we we cannot sit down here and throw rocks at those things. Or try no, to get use them the gun. Yeah. Slingshot. No, no, no. We don't want. We don't want to do that. All right. Okay, Major. Thank you. <laughs> it sounds you. fun, but... It does, uh, yeah. Sounds fun, but I don't think that'll be the professional thing to do. <laughs> sounds fun. <laughs> it does sound fun, though. <laughs> Take us some stress <laughs> off, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you just got back from vacation. Why are you stressed? Because you're well, stressing him out. Because <laughs> you're stressing him out. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of work just piled up, so there's a lot of things I got to take care of now. All right. Well, let, go take care of business, Major. And thank you for coming on. And we love yeah. that background. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. I Best I one yet. Know. Yep. <laughs> love it. Take it easy. Yep. That's that. Okay. Sir. Thanks, Anton. Quick break. And we're coming back with Jason Solis and the American Cancer Society next, right here on the link. Good morning. Diving in, sing our chorus. On August 28th, join us as we illuminate hope at the American Cancer Society Relay for Life Luminaria exhibit at the FDMS Phoenix Center. From 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., witness the illuminous display of lights, a representation of our love and respect for those who have battled cancer. We will remember those who have lost to cancer, honor those who have beaten this enemy, and support those who are currently in during the treatments for cancer. The KUAM Podcast Network is back and on demand, featuring a great variety of podcasts from our island and region, including culture, lifestyle, awareness, crime, politics, commentary, comedy, and entertainment. Available on most streaming platforms. The KUAM Podcast Network. Subscribe and listen now. The Culture Club returns to KOM Digital and KOM News Weekend Edition, highlighting Guam's young artists, activists, and crafters as they work to protect, preserve, and promote our Chamorro culture. Watch this weekly feature on the digital platforms of KOM News Weekend Edition, brought to you by Hanum.
WAM's multi-platform morning show, The Link, just got a little more delicious with Feed Me Fridays. Chris, Sabrina, Jason, and the rest of the morning crew will take some time off each Friday to talk, taste, and tempt you with all the latest and greatest food and drinks on Guam. Old faves, new hits, and everything else we can put in our bellies. It's Feed Me Fridays on The Link, brought to you by King's Restaurants, Ruby Tuesday Guam, and Devondale. The KUAM Care Force presents The Greater Good every Wednesday on The Link. This special feature presents interesting and informative interviews with community leaders and organization representatives to bring awareness to our residents and encourage participation in planned activities to celebrate. The Greater Good is brought to you by your friends at Jay Goodman, a happiness company, and Guam Winter Memorial. Celebrate life. After a year with so many games and events delayed or unplayed, the world is ready for anything and everything in the world of sports. KUAM Communications is ready with more games, more championships, and more specials that are guaranteed to bring out the fan in you. Don't miss a minute of gameplay from NBC on KUAM TV 8 or from CBS on KUAM TV 11. Every month, we'll bring you the action and excitement. Brought to you locally by Michelob Ultra, Superior Light Beer, Marianas Irrigation and Landscape, and Docomo Pacific. Just more great reasons to tune in and turn on so you'll fall in love with TV again with the best from KUAM Communications. Welcome back to the link everybody and you know with with biased opinion I want to say we saved the best for the very last and everything because we have Elena Santiago and Joe Rios who are representing the American Cancer Society and Relay for Life. It is a event that everybody knows on Guam. I will dare say everybody has gotten involved with at some point on Guam. We as Guamanians, you know, we we rallied together. We joined as one family, one community to fight against cancer because it has touched each and every one of us. And undoubtedly, you know, um, the center point and, and the most emotional part of uh, the Relay for Life experience is the Luminaria Ceremony. You know, it's it's this beautiful memorial where, you know, we... We put these candles to celebrate the lives of people that we've lost to cancer, people that are fighting it right now, people that have survived and everything. Um, and it is a sight to see. So because things are so weird in the world and everything, uh, Joe and Elena, I'll let you take over, but there is a Luminaria exhibit right now where the tradition of honoring those uh, who are on their cancer journeys, um, that tradition continues. Yeah, it sure does. And you know, it, it um, <clears throat> like you said, uh, with the lockdowns and with the pandemic, it's just a, a challenge for, for us. But um, with the committee, we were able to come up with certain programs throughout the, um, the, the remainder part of the year. We actually started Relay um, from July all, and it extends all the way up to um, uh, December. So uh, <clears throat> for the month of August, we have our Luminaria display and we were able to get a site that could, um, and you know, planning for this event, we had to follow a lot of the protocols and we had to, we didn't know when, you know, we can gather and when we can have so many people in one place. So um, with uh, the location that we have over at the Father Duenas um, um, Phoenix Gym, it is uh, scheduled for August 28th. And that is the place to go to, um, to actually visit the luminarias that, that we have on display. We have 31 teams that have uh, contributed uh, um, uh, luminaria bags. And, you know, I, I believe we started this last year, the year before, where we have not only the traditional luminaria bags, but then we also have the, the gold um, uh, luminaria bags so that we can honor, you know, and remember those that have um, lost uh, their lives to, to cancer. So at our big event when we used to gather over at GW, it was just uh, the highlight. Everyone was there gathering around the center to um, to really take a look at um, <clears throat> the luminarias. And um, over the many, many years, the teams have just been so creative with how they they um, they honor and they <clears throat> memorialize their family members, their loved ones with how they decorate their bags. So we're just so excited that we're able to you know, provide this exhibit um, over at um, FD on um, uh, Saturday, August 28th. Now, Elena, you know, you know how we do things here on Guam and, you know, and, and as Joe said, so much of what we do, practically everything we do is, you know, centered around family. And, you know, if somebody that we know where we're related to or, you know, even an acquaintance um, is touched by cancer, then we all go through it. And, you know, and and, and that's by choice. You know, we said, you know, we're, we're in this with you. We're going to be uh, in this with you and everything like that. And so this experience of seeing the Luminaria uh, in person has always been a big community event. So 
uh, can you maybe shed some light on what what people will feel when they go there and, and they experience it now in this new format? Oh, it's a very touching um, ceremony, um, Jason. Um, and like you said, it's one of the most anticipated ceremonies at any Relay for Life. Um, and so, you know, with our community, we're so close knit. Yeah. Um, I think everybody just uh, everybody just, you know, appreciates that we have this to honor those um, they've lost or someone who is battling or someone who, you know, um, overcome it. And that's, you know, that, that's our that's our luminary ceremony for you. Yeah. And now, Joe, of course, the obvious question is people are going to say, you know, I, I want to continue um, to honor someone. And, you know, we here at KU, when we've got, you know, some of our coworkers, we've lost a couple of our coworkers. Um, one of our coworkers is a cancer survivor. You know, Christy, she's always our captain. Um, you know, she beat breast cancer. Um, yeah. And we, we always do everything we can to, you know, honor them with, with the Lumina ceremony. So how can we participate and, you know, how can we continue to, to have representation there at the exhibit? Yeah, I mean, um, Christy over at, um, at, at the KOM <clears throat> has just been a great help. She's been part of the committee and just offering, you know, just the support that we need. And, you know, of course she is a survivor. So then that, that's even more inspiration for the planning committee to, to really work and uh, make this uh, make this happen. Um, Luminaria bags are still on sale. Um, they're, they're on sale for $15. We have a, a dedication, a video dedication. So for, for those that would like to have a, a photo image, uh, you can go ahead and provide a camera ready um, ad, then that'll be an additional um, uh, $10 that will be displayed over at the at FD while um, throughout the day because the event is from um, 10 to 5. And um, uh, for anyone who is interested, there, there's bags that are on sale. Just uh, give you know um, Elena a call at 477-9451. Did I memorize that, Kirk? I should have yeah. that yeah. number down already. Oh, your, your phone and, is going to um, be ringing off the hook today, Elena. <laughs> That's what yeah, we do at yeah, so we, we, we like helping people that, that do ama amazing causes and, you know, really have that sense of what it means to be Guamanian. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's thank it, um, you know, Dunkel and us to do Mossy to KOM Care Force. And then, of course, our other sponsors, we got Bank of Guam um, and Docomo Pacific that has really supported us, uh, you know, this year during this, um, during this season for, for Relay this year. And um, for those that are, um, uh, let's see, those have purchased bags, uh, you can go ahead and turn them in to, to Elena over at the office. Uh, you just go ahead and give her a call. Uh, we are following, um, you know, protocols for the office because there's there's patients that actually do visit the office. So please call ahead when you're going to drop off the bags. So, you know, it's still on sale and still available. And then um, if, uh, you know, you're just so busy during the week and you, August 28 comes around and, and you just remember you got to go to FD, then the bags are going to be on sale there. Uh, it'll be for $20 um, on site. So then you're, you're available to purchase and then, you know, decorate or just have one of us uh, decorate. Uh, we'll just go ahead and write the name of the person that you're going to honor or <clears throat> uh, in memory of, and then just have it displayed. But yeah, there's just um, the luminarias that are that are on sale. We have other we have teams that are um, you know working on their fundraisers and and um, uh, trying to to uh, you know donate and contribute to relay this year. So if you are part of a team, then um, and that's another way to help out to uh, you know to <clears throat> help us um, you know fund uh, the research and the so many other different things that the American Cancer Society is doing Absolutely. to um, find a cure. All right. So um, Elena, I'd like to give you the last word and parting shot because you know so many people say you know. Uh, where there is struggle, there's, al there's also opportunity. And, and, you know, rather look at this and say, you know, we're under the coronavirus and the pandemic hit us and everything, so the luminary ceremony is, isn't going to be the same and everything like that. This is a chance for people to actually maybe have, you said, like a, un a new and unique experience or build new traditions for the way we honor, you know, um, the people that we love that have been touched by cancer. So, you know, maybe, maybe just talk about, like, what, what this means, uh, you know, for people to honor people in a new way. Oh, man. Um, yeah, I mean, I, like Joe said, you know, there's, this is an opportunity uh, for folks to honor um, those who they've lost, who have been battling, who's overcome it. Um, and by purchasing a luminaria, um, they can do so through our office. Um, you can call us at 477-9451, or they can do an online purchase at relayforlife.org slash guamgu. Um, and they can definitely get there, you know, if they don't, are not comfortable coming to the office um, they can do so um, 
by going online. Um, and again, we want to stress that folks are still able to, to purchase their lumin luminarias this week. Um, so just contact our office. All right. Well, it's and one of our favorite Guam traditions, too. So thank you guys for making this available once again. Thank you. Yeah, you, guys, you guys do amazing work. So that is the greater good. And as we do each and every Wednesday here on the link, the greater good is brought to you by our friends at Jay Goodman, a happiness company, and Guam Weird Windward Memorial World Day 2 celebrate life. Jay Goodman, of course, has quality products, the best customer support, and friendly service open 24-7 and order right now at guamgoodman.com. In-person pickup or online delivery on Guam is free. Order with confidence. It is the Jay Goodman way. And your love is everlasting. And that's the, the motto and the mission of Guam Windward Memorial. To schedule a tour, please call 688-6371. Joe and Elena, thank you once again. And we're now going to go to our Cover Me segment. And this Time, we have our friend Jonah Hanum with his latest music video. Thank you. Yeah, she only tweet for the clickbait. Doing lines, trying to fix it. One too many intakes Repeating all the mistakes Getting drunk on a school night Someone get her in the mood right now More drugs than a food fight And she's still so beautiful like wow Why do we fall for all of these crazy ones? Yeah. Said I would never but maybe just maybe one yeah. I know that you're bad for my health. I know that I'm probably just tripping, but baby, you sending me mixed emotions, and still I be taking it, yeah. Somebody help me, I'm tripping, I'm tripping on. Yeah. She a hot mess, and no one can clean it up. I'm so in love with the social media, but she's so in love with the paraphernalia. She only tweet for the clickbait, doing lines, trying to fix it. Had one too many intakes. Repeating all the mistakes Getting drunk on a school night Someone get her in the mood right now More drugs than a food fight And she's still so beautiful like wow You probably heard this a million times before But what you rely on I'm all of this whitey for Baby girl born in 1994 what do you gotta be so self-righteous for? All that I'm trying to say is I am just caring for you in a way that no one has ever dared to or ever cared to. Love you at any damn point in your life. All that I'm trying to say is we could get high every day and it wouldn't matter because even if you gave me every reason to hate you, girl, I would still love you the same. I yeah, yeah. she only tweet for the clickbait. Doing lines, trying to fix it. Had one too many intakes. Repeating all the mistakes Getting drunk on a school night 